I'm calling to order this uh, hearing. This is a hearing of the Committee of the Whole. The fourth and final hearing the Committee of the Whole is having on the um, budgets for agencies under the purview of the Committee of the Whole. Uh, these are budgets that are in the Mayor's proposed budget that he submitted to the Council on March 28th for fiscal year 2014, which begins October 1st of this year. The um, committees of the Council are all of them uh, having hearings over the course of this month and uh, finishing at the very beginning of May, hearings on the proposed budgets for the different agencies under the various committees. The committees will complete this uh, process on May 3rd. The Committee of the Whole will have a hearing on May 3rd on, uh, to elicit testimony overall on the Fiscal Year 2014 Budget Request Act, that's the budget itself, as it's submitted to Congress, on the uh, Fiscal Year 2014 Budget Support Act, that is a legislation with many uh, titles and subtitles that support the budget, uh, typically contain provisions related to uh, the budget. And, uh, and then in addition, uh, at that hearing, we will be hearing testimony with regard to the um, FY Fiscal Year 2013 Revised Budget Request Emergency Adjustment Act, which is also known as the Supplemental Act for the current fiscal year. So that's Friday, May 3rd, beginning at 10 a.m. in this room, the Council Chamber. The committees of the Council will be meeting on May 6th, 8th, and 9th to mark up their reports, making recommendations with regard to the agency budget for fiscal year 2014. The Committee of the Whole is scheduled to meet on May 9th at 4 o'clock to mark up its um, report with the with regard to the agencies under the Committee of the Whole. The Council members will meet informally thereafter and on May 22nd the Council will be voting uh, on the Budget Request Act and first reading on the Budget Support Act. So that's our schedule for consideration of the budget. Uh, today's hearing, as I said, is the fourth and final hearing that the Committee of the Whole is having. And the te hearing today is on uh, two agencies, the District of Columbia Auditor and the University of the District of Columbia will have the testimony in that order. My guess is that the auditor will be 45 to 45 minutes to an hour, uh, and then we'll get to the University of the District of Columbia. So why don't we get started with uh, the District of Columbia Auditor. I have on the witness list two citizens, Geraldine Talley Hobby, if he's here, if she can come forward, and Michael Syndrome, if he's present, uh, he can come forward. And if neither of them are here, Ms. Hobby or Mr. Syndrome, then we'll proceed to Yolanda Branch, who's the uh, auditor. And it's our practice um, that uh, we swear in government witnesses, so if you, Ms. Uh, Branch, and anybody else is going to be, might be testifying or answering questions, if you would raise your right hand. Do you swear from under penalty of law that the testimony you are about to give to the Council of the District of Columbia Committee of the Whole is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, you may be seated. You each answered in the affirmative. And while you're setting up, let me also say that uh, typically our uh, process is having uh, citizens testify before we have the agency itself. And uh, I try to um, have, since there are four seats at that table, Four citizens come up at a time uh, in the order of the agenda, so I have no idea if they agree with each other, but that makes the hearing a little bit more efficient. And for UDC, we will have witnesses on a, um, the citizen witnesses on a three-minute clock so that we can get through the um, 14 individuals who um, signed up to testify. Uh, Ms. Branch, uh, do we have a copy of your statement? Yes, we do. You do? You're ready. Chairman Mendelson and members of the Committee of the Whole, thank you for the opportunity to present testimony on the proposed fiscal year 2014 budget for the Office of the District of Columbia Auditor. I'm Yolanda Branch, District of Columbia Auditor. Accompanying me are Lawrence Perry, Deputy District of Columbia Auditor, and Hussein, Hussein Aiden, Agency Financial Officer. I will briefly address the Mayor's proposed fiscal year 2014 budget 
and staffing for the Office of the District of Columbia Auditor. The mission of the Office of the District of Columbia Auditor is to assist the Council in performing its responsibilities by auditing the accounts and programs of the district to ensure that effective, programmatic, and budgetary decisions are made. The Office of the DC Auditor examines the use of public funds, evaluates district government programs and activities, and provides analysis and recommendations to assist the Council in making effective oversight, programmatic, and budgetary decisions. Through our audit work, we seek to ensure that the, the district's government operations, programs, and activities are conducted economically, efficiently, effectively, and in compliance with applicable laws, regulations, and rules. Underlying this mandate is our responsibility to be alert to instances of fraud, waste, abuse, and mismanagement of district resources. The locally funded fiscal year 2014 budget for the Office of the DC Auditor proposed by the Mayor is $4.6 million with 34 FTEs. The $4.6 million budget includes a total of $650,000, which is to be used exclusively to fund the council mandated evaluation of District of Columbia Public Schools pursuant to the Public Education Reform Amendment Act of 2007. Excluding the $650,000 in funding for the DCPS evaluation of schools, the proposed fiscal year 2014 local operating fund budget for ODCA is $3.9 million. The budget for ODCA in fiscal year 2013 also was $4.6 million and also included $650,000 to fund the evaluation of public schools. Excluding the $650,000 in funding for D the DCPS evaluation, the approved fiscal year 2013 operation, operating budget for ODCA was $3.9 million. While the fiscal year 2014 proposed budget includes 34 FTEs for ODCA, three of the 34 FTEs are not fully funded. As a result, three FTEs will be funded at a level that will not permit ODCA to hire individuals who have the necessary skills and experience to conduct effective audits. In FY 2013, to cover insufficiently funded operating expenses such as training, information technology so software le leases, and copier leases, ODCA reprogrammed funding from personnel services to non-personnel services. Since the proposed budget of $3.9 million for FY 2014 does not include a budget increase, as in FY 2013, ODCA will have to use funding for personnel services to pay for non-personnel expenses. We are requesting an operating budget increase of $300,000 for fiscal year 2014. With the $300,000 increase, ODCA will be able to fully fund the three FTEs that are not fully funded and adequately fund non-personnel services. With the $300,000 increase, it will not be necessary for ODCA to use personnel services to pay for non-personnel services. In addition, ODCA requests $100,000 to fund the District of Columbia Auditor Legal Fund. The District of Columbia Auditor Legal Fund is to be used to enforce the DC Auditor subpoena power. However, the legislation that established the Auditor Legal Fund relied on the successful enforcement of subpoenas for funding. As a result, the Auditor Legal Fund is unfunded. In fiscal year 2014, if a situation develops that requires the Office of the DC Auditor to initiate a lawsuit to enforce the subpoena authority, ODCA would have to find the funds to retain outside counsel and pay additional fees and costs. In 2009, before the passage of the legislation that established the Auditor Legal Fund, it cost ODCA 
$101,692 to initiate a lawsuit to enforce the subpoena authority. An increase in the FY 2014 budget of $400,000 would provide ODCA with the necessary funding to meet the expectations of the council and residents by issuing relevant, comprehensive, timely audit reports. Regarding the issue of the timely issuance of audit reports, one of our top priorities for fiscal year 2014 is to increase the number of audit reports that are issued and to decrease the time that it takes to con con conduct audits. The audit process is complex and frequently involves unanticipated issues that must be addressed before the issuance of the report. On occasion, unanticipated issues can delay the issuance of audit reports. As required by generally accepted auditing standards, our audit process consists of four phases, planning, surveying, field work, and reporting. In the planning phase, we are required to ensure that the staff assigned to conduct the audit is independent and competent. We also have to determine the audit's preliminary objectives and establish the audit timeline. In the survey phase, we are required to obtain a clear understanding of the relevant operations through background research, inter internal control and risk assessments, and legislative analysis. Based on this understanding, we design and execute our field work strategy consisting of test sampling and verification. The survey and field work phases require that we conduct a number of interviews, gain access to all relevant documentation, and complete the necessary analysis and testing. Finally, during the reporting phase, we evaluate and communicate survey results and field work findings. We also complete a comprehensive quality assurance process that includes a minimum of three weeks for agency review and comment on the draft report. To increase the number of audit reports and decrease the time that it takes to conduct audits, ODCA is working to improve the management of key areas of the audit process. In general, the most common reason for delays in the issuance of audit reports is poor planning of the audit and inadequate supervision. To decrease delays in the issuance of audit reports, ODCA improved our policies and procedures and we are increasing our audit supervision. In addition, we will continue to build a staff that has the requ requisite skills and experience to deliver relevant, accurate audit reports in a timely manner. However, to ensure that ODCA can continue to build a staff that has the requ requisite skills and experience, the fiscal year 2014 budget should include full funding for all of the 34 FTEs that are designated for ODCA in the Mayor's proposed budget. To provide timely, comprehensive, relevant audit reports and to fund the Auditor Legal Fund, I urge the Council to increase the fiscal year 2014 budget of the Office of the DC Auditor by $400,000. Chairman Mendelson and members of the committee, thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you. We will respond to any questions. Thank you, Ms. Branch. Um, let me see. I do have some questions for you. How much is the, um, does the pure evaluation cost? $325,000 for each of uh, the studies. So for FY14, uh, our budget includes two studies at a total of $650,000. I don't see that that follows. Uh, there are three contracts. Contract 1 was executed in FY12. Contract 2 is being executed this April. And Contract 3 would be executed uh, October 2013. So why would, um, 
And if each one is $325,000, how do you get $650,000 in FY14? And uh, you're exactly right, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the two, including $650,000 in our budget, uh, creates the impression that our budget is uh, $4.6 million. Is what? Is 4.6? No, that's not my question. Okay. How do you get $650,000 in 2014? Oh, I can answer that. The, um, there was an intra-district transfer of funds in 2013, and in fiscal year 12, um, the contract wasn't issued um, in a timely manner for the pair evaluation. So <clears throat> what happened, in order to stay on course with the evaluation for the five-year plan, um, DCPS reprogrammed, I mean, the Deputy Mayor for Education reprogrammed money in fiscal year 13 uh, for the 12 study, and the intradistrict transfer remained on the books. So there was, there was actually two contracts in fiscal year 13. The first one was issued. I have no idea what you just said. Okay. The first contract was finalized September 15th, and therefore should have been charged against FY12, was it? No, the signature for it was it was charged to uh, fiscal year 13. Why was it charged to FY13 when uh, it was signed on uh, f September 15th? We just signed the, um, for all of the deliverables on that date, but well, it, didn't go in, it didn't go into effect. The date on the front of the contract shows that it doesn't go into effect until October 1st, 2013. Uh, was there not an intradistrict transfer in 2012? Yes, there was an intradistrict transfer in 2012, but that... So you let that money lapse? Yes, that money did lapse because the contract wasn't put into place. The deputy mayor... No, the contract was signed September 15th. You could have <clears throat> charged, the, charged used the money for that contract. Right, but we couldn't have gotten any deliverables in so? 2012. So? This, the peer evaluation was required, as I recall, in 2009. Right. And uh, so we're playing catch up here. Right. And we're doing uh, five years of assessments in three years. Right. Correct? Mm hmm. Okay. This contract was signed September 15th. Yes. And there was uh, money available on September 15th. Right. And instead of using that money to pay for the first contract, you let it lapse. That's your testimony. No, 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 what lapsed was, if I, for a second, Mr. Chairman, the, the, the issue was um, the deputy mayor staff had not taken the steps right. with, the, with, with, the, uh, with the contract, and that's why no work was done. It wasn't our responsibility. Right. There had been no steps taken with the deputy mayor and the contractor to get the work started in fiscal year 12, and so at the end of... That has nothing to do with my question. Okay. The contract was signed September 15th. We finished the deliverables, putting all of the necessary paperwork and negotiations together for the contract in September so that we could have I'm it sorry, ready. I have a statement here. Contract number one finalized September 15, 2012. Yes. That tells me that it was finalized September 15, 2012. Is that in the response that I gave? Uh, I think it was in March. Yes. Yeah, we finished compiling the contract. Okay. And you had the money. And you let the money lapse. Yes, but we couldn't have gotten any deliverables for that. With well, I don't understand why that money. matters. You have a contract. The contract, I believe, was to look at um, look at school years 2011. Look at school year 2011. Mm -hmm. The money's there, and you just let it lapse. We didn't have a contract in place. To issue it was a contract. Finalized September 15th. I, I'm not getting why you couldn't use that 2012 money. It was finalized September 15th, putting the contract together. The contract on the, on the face of the contract says October 1, 2013, that they would start the work. They weren't even going to be able to start the work until October 1, 2013, because of the delays in putting the contract together. They weren't even in a place 
the, the bottom to start line work. is that you let twenty, you let two hundred, three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars lapse. That's the bottom line. All right. So contract one is getting paid out of twenty thirteen dollars. Contract two is getting paid out of twenty thirteen dollars. Correct. That leaves contract three, which gets paid out of twenty uh, fourteen dollars. Correct. Okay. Each of the contracts is three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Correct. Okay, so why are you talking about six hundred fifty thousand dollars in FY fourteen? I mentioned the six hundred fifty thousand dollars because when you look at the mayor's proposed budget, uh, the there are two listings for FY fourteen for three hundred twenty-five three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Those uh, the total of six hundred fifty thousand dollars. Will go to the the should only there only should be one payment, and uh, our total is that right? Yeah, and I'm sorry. And as a result, our budget is 3.9, which is the same as it was in FY13. That's why I mentioned the payments. Well, wait a minute, your your budget's uh, 4.6. Exactly. If it's 4.6, and 325 is necessary for the contract. Am, am I missing um, something, um, Mr. Uh, agency Fiscal Officer? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Aiden. In 2013, 2014, uh, the mayor, they moved the inter-district fund because every year we go through a long process of getting the 325000 So their explanation was they moved from the inter-district fund into our local. However, instead of taking the second one, they just published with the budget book and discussing with the OBB and the mayor's office and the So you've uh, gone to the mayor they and asked gonna, They make mistake. Yeah, they say they're going to remove it later on. So you've gone to the mayor and asked the mayor to reduce the budget by $325,000? Yes. No, why would you do that? No, what is they removed from the inter-district <laughs> to the local fund? The budget I have the lists three hundred twenty-five. The reason we would do that is that the funds could only be used for the contracts with, for the peer review. So it's not $325,000 that we could use for our We're not operations. Following that at all. The interdistrict can only be used for the peer contract. But the, the, uh, and the budget that I have has $325,000 um, interdistrict. Yeah. So maybe they made a mistake and they uh, gave you $325,000 twice, and so you went to them and said, reduce us by 325000 No, they removed the inter-district. They also build it within our local fund. If you look at our local fund contract, it also included 325000 Yes, but that's not restricted. I'm sorry, am I missing something here? The budget I've got lists $325,000 is inter-district and $4.2 million uh, general fund, local funds. Well, the, the, the mayor's um, budget book on page A11, it lists the, for FY14, it lists under contractual services uh, the $662,000. Uh, if you, we took the, the 650 yeah. from that, that I would leave it. us 12. That's because it specifically says contractual services. That's why we made the determination that contractual services was referring to the two $325,000 contracts totaling $650,000. That's why we went to the mayor's staff and said that that money we only needed 320, only $325,000 was required for the one contract in FY14. I'm just not getting it because it sounds to me that what you've done is you've gone to the mayor and asked him to reduce your budget by $325,000 because he's funding you twice for the peer evaluation. Mm -hmm. The result is that you'll have $325,000. If he does that, you'll have $325,000 less, which of course then means that you have $325,000 less. Mm -hmm. Um, I um, can, can you explain to me again, Ms. Branch, uh, on page three of your testimony, a $300,000 increase to fully fund three FTEs. On the previous page, you said that the three of the FTEs are not fully funded. That says to me they're partially funded. Are they partially funded? Yes. How much are they funded? 
the total funding for those three positions? 30,000. An average for 30,000 each. You said 30,000? Yeah. So the current budget has 30,000 each for them? Each position, yes. Or a total of 90000 for the three? Yes. And that money you're not spending because you can't hire the three people because they're not fully funded, correct? Correct. All right, so how much additional do you need for them? To fully fund the, the three positions, we need the nine. To fully fund the three positions, we need uh, $185,000 plus $30,000 for fringe benefits. So that's two hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Two hundred twenty, two hundred fifteen thousand dollars. So each of these positions gets paid ninety thousand dollars. An average, an average year. What are the positions? They're all auditors. They're what? Auditors. I'm looking at your Schedule A, and while there are a few people who are paid more than 90000 most of them are paid less. Budget Administration Analyst, I assume that's an auditor? Correct? Yeah. And then you have a lot of them. And then the third one is one of the senior analysts. Four hundred and six thousand. On average, they are ninety thousand. So the average is around ninety thousand dollars for an auditor. And this is the schedule. It's highlighted on the list. The third one's outsourced. One. Um, what is the uh, what is the need for the director of financial management? Who's that? The, the director of financial management. Where is that? I don't see that on the list. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I don't on schedule. I see a person with that title. Well, I'm just asking. It's uh, my impression that's one of the vacant positions. You know, the, the three, uh, the, and these are the three that are highlighted, is that right? Yeah. The, ori the original two are highlighted, mm -hmm. and the third one is one of the seniors. Mm -hmm. 110. So the, the positions that we have uh, on, our, on our Schedule A uh, is vacant are two financial auditors and a senior financial auditor. Say that again? So in, regarding your question about a director of financial management, the, yeah. the three vacancies that we have are two financial auditors and a vacancy for a senior financial auditor. One analyst, one financial, and one senior. I'm, I'm looking at, uh, I seem to have two different uh, Schedule A's from you. And um, the one that you attached to your answers dated uh, February 8th. Lists a financial auditor at seventy-two thousand. That says vacant outsourced. Lists a financial auditor at seventy-four thousand. 
risks an analyst at 92,000. That's not an average of, and it doesn't say senior, whatever. In fact, you list, um, you list one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten positions are vacant. Do you have ten vacancies right now? Right now we have eight vacancies. Since the, we submitted that document, we, we hired two individuals. Okay. The, um, there, there's three that are highlighted. Uh, two is unfunded and one is outsourced. And those are the ones I just mentioned. It's 72,000, 74,000, and 92,000. That doesn't come out to an average of 90,000 each. Of course, you can arrange this any way you want to. And you could, um, but anyway, that's what you identified in that uh, schedule as being um, vacant and unfunded. Looking the old one. So what? So this is the new one. So explain. Um, so I'm just not getting how how you get to ninety thousand dollars each for your your three unfunded positions. But let me ask you this. I sent you an email, and the email, uh, uh, this was a month or so ago, and the email was uh, that um, when I talked to the mayor with regard to your budget, let me see if I can find the email first. Give me just a moment here. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I think I remember the email that you're talking about. Um, in that email, you raised a question about the four positions from the CBCU, uh, our certified business compliance unit, and the, rec the suggestion from the mayor that those four positions uh, would stay at ODCA. However, the function would go to DSLBD, and your thought at that time was since those four positions uh, would stay at ODCA and the function, and I'm sorry, the positions would leave and the function would go, that would be the source for the $400,000 that we requested? Is that the Not, not exactly, about? but close. Okay. Um, The, um, when um, LSDB compliance was added to your responsibilities, $400,000 was added to your budget. That was a couple of years ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. What the mayor is proposing is to take back that uh, function, but not take back the $400,000. And at that time, um, we then, in your email, suggested that as a result we wouldn't need the $400,000. Since then, uh, the mayor has introduced legislation, proposed legislation, that in addition to moving a function to DSLBD, the funding also for those four positions would go to DSLBD. Where is that legislation? It's in the mayor's It's uh, an, uh, the Fiscal Year 2014 Budget Support Act of uh, 2013 uh, in Section um, 263. It says, and this is in reference to the Compliance Unit Amendment Act. That's what that uh, unit in ODCA is called. Uh, Section 263 says, all positions, personnel, property, records, and unexpended balances of appropriations, allocation, and other funds available to the CBCU shall go to DSLBD. But that's not in the budget. No. Okay, well, if it's not in the budget, then not happening. 
right? The budget I have, we can go back to this if you want to, the budget that I have is $4.6 million, including $325,000 twice, unless you gave that away, and um, it includes the 400000 if in fact the you, do, you, do you see it deducted in the budget book? I just called the uh, the proposed amendment the uh, the act to your attention. Uh, well, I'm glad you did because uh, we can clarify that language. But uh, the reality is that the budget table five in your budget does not show any deduction. So if, in fact, the uh, $400,000 that the CBCU represents stays with us, then you're right, that will address our need for uh, $300,000 plus the $100,000 for the auditor's fund, auditor's legal fund. What is the status of filling these uh, vacancies? We have, we're in the process of interviewing. We have one uh, offer letter outstanding. We should receive a response on that uh, next week. And we have two follow-up interviews scheduled for next week. So we're moving as quickly as we can to fill those positions. So you have eight vacancies and you're interviewing people for three of them? We're interviewing for all of the positions, the, uh, the eight vacant positions. I thought I heard you say that you are interviewing two people and then interviewing one. Those are, that's where we are in the process. Our, my goal, though, is to fill those eight positions. We my are question partners. was, so you're only at the moment you're interviewing for only three of the positions. If you're interviewing three people, you can't fill more than three positions. I'm sorry, I, mi I misunderstood your question, Mr. Chairman. Could you repeat it, please? I said, where are you in filling these vacancies? You said you're trying to fill all the vacancies. You have oh, interviews with two people next week and an interview with somebody else. I'm That's sorry, I misunderstood people. when you said these. You're interviewing vacancies. three people, then you're only, at the moment, about to fill three of the positions. And we will continue to interview so that we fill all eight of the vacancies. Why does it take so long? It's interesting, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, 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 the skills that are required to fill the position, people with prior audit experience, familiarity with GAGAS, and uh, knowledge of the district government, uh, and an interest in, in working in the office of the D.C. Auditor. Those four elements, uh, it's taking us a while to find individuals. We are, I'm pleased with the individuals that we're finding, but it does take a while to find that unique set of skills. In um, February, you had 10 vacancies? During our performance hearing, we did have 10 vacancies. Would you happen to know offhand how many you had on October 1st? No, I don't. Do you? I can get back to you on the number that we had um, vacant on October 1. What is your uh, fringe rate? The fringe rate? What's that? The fringe rate. The fringe rate is around. No, I don't want to know 19, around. 19.5 percent. No, I want to know exactly what it is. The fringe benefit. Correct. It's around 19. No, I don't want to know around, Mr. Aiden. I want to know exactly what the fringe rate is. All the fringe benefits. Correct. 19.8 percent. You're the agency fiscal officer, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Are you able to tell me what the fringe rate is? The French rate is 19.8 percent. That's in the FY14. FY14, yeah, an average. What does that mean, an average? <laughs> Overall, uh, it's 19.8. What is what is the fringe in FY13? It was close to 19 percent. You can't tell me specifically. I would say 19.2. So was it 19.2 or you think it was 19.2? I mean, this is just a budget hearing. I'm just trying to understand the budget. This is a question I've asked of every agency that's come yes, before me. What is the fringe rate? 
And you're the agency fiscal officer. I would think you could tell me what the rate is. Absolutely, 19.2. 19.2 for FY13. Yes. 19.8 for FY14. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Is there any salary lapse in this uh, that was taken out in this budget? In FY14, no. Correct. Was there any taken out in FY13? No. Uh, generally, how many vacancies do you have at a time? Around eight, six, ten? We ha are normally we only have, uh, I mean, speaking about FY12, we had four vacancies. But I, as a result of the change in administration and our uh, developing a, a more focused approach to our audits, we've had a number of individuals, a larger number of individuals leave our staff. So as a result, uh, the number since FY12 to FY13 is, is around eight individuals. Well, if, you, if you've had four vacancies, that's what I'm hearing you say. Generally, you have around four okay. vacancies. And... Um, you said change in administration. That means when um, Ms. Nichols left and you, you were appointed, that's the change of administration, correct? Yes. You said the number of vacancies increased. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, you are. Um, why would uh, these three positions be, uh, are they frozen? The three that are unfunded? Yes. No, they're not, they're not frozen. Uh, well, in 2012, when we have the budget reduction, 2011 and 12, uh, we had a budget reduction and we used to close that gap by unfunding some of the positions. They were not completely frozen. In 2012? In 2012. So we carry over into 2013 and when we get increase in 2011, uh, we use for two new FTEs as directed, even though we would prefer to completely fully fund those positions in FY13. I'm not, I didn't understand that last part. I said originally in FY2012 when we have the budget cut, that's when we take originally, uh, when we unfunded the positions, they were, but they were not frozen. You're saying there was a budget cut in 2012? Yes. Uh, between 2011 and 2012, your budget dropped by about um, 150,000. It was built, Mr. Mr. Chairman, it was built from 2011 to 2012. So in 11, we had 244,000. You had how much? 244,000 budget cut in 2011. And it, it affected those two FTEs. We have three positions that we reduce, and then one position. Wait a minute, that's between 2010 and 2011 you saw a reduction. I'm not following you. What, what year was the cut? Uh, we have a 2011, 244,000 in FY 2011. I guess I'm looking at your actuals, and I, I don't see... Yeah, you're looking for the actuals. I'm looking at the I'm actuals. The I actual. don't see uh, a reduction to that magnitude, but... Yeah, the actual, it just shows the expenditures. I understand. Yeah. But, but I can provide the document to, to you. What? I said we can provide the document to you that shows the cuts. Yes, but of course what's more meaningful here is what the actuals are because the actual show what the agency spent. Yeah. What, this, what the agency spent presumably is what it needed. Uh, 
I, where I was trying to go with this is why you couldn't use your uh, salary lapse to uh, fund these positions. The salary lapse? So we, we couldn't move as quickly for the NPS. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, that's the reason. Why don't you say that? We needed to use the funding from those, um, from the personal services to cover the uh, non-personal services that we had. Well, what does that look like? Uh, let me see. In your testimony, where you ask for an increase. I'm looking at page three. Um, I'm not seeing any part of your request for additional funding to cover non-personal services unless you include the legal fund for that. Yeah. The $300,000, uh, in, in addition to the FTEs, the full funding for the FTEs, it also includes um, funding for non for non-personnel services. So as part of the $300,000, we want, uh, we need $35,000 uh, to cover training, $40,000 for contractual services, and uh, another $9,500 for equipment to include leases. So the breakdown is uh, $215,000 for, to cover the positions and 84500 uh, for non-personal services, totaling $300,000. That's for FY14. For 14. Um, all right, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, how, how much money was, um, in dollars, can you tell me what the salary lapse was last year, the actual salary lapse, Mr. Aiden? I would say it was around 260,000. 200 and what thousand? 260. I'm sorry, 260. 260. 260. Yes. And current, this year the salary lapse is to date, do you know, roughly? Date, I would say, because we already use projecting that salary labs into reprogramming. We already use 240,000. Reprogramming for what? Reprogramming from personnel to non personnel. I'm just, you know, we're talking about a lot of, well, in the scheme of the district's budget, it's not a lot of money, but in terms of your needs, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing why the money isn't there for hiring these positions and why the money's not there for the non-personal services. $260,000 was left unspent last year from salary lapse. Yes. And $240,000 has already been reprogrammed for non-personal services, which presumably covers more non-personal services needs than you've identified. So I'm just not getting where the needs are here. $240,000. The $240,000 was included for $110,000 unexpended, I mean, unexpected expenditure. How much was? $110,000. That's for this year? Yes, for this year. You say this year there's been 240,000 reprogrammed? Yeah, we reprogrammed. And of that 104,000 was, um, how did you characterize it? 110,000 was uh, a unexpected settlement. settlement. Uh, 
Um, the, the law was changed with regard to um, litigation. Do I remember that correctly? That um, if you have to go to court to subpoena, that uh, you will, um, assuming you win, you will uh, get your fees paid? That's, that is the uh, law that established the auditor legal fund. So it's, it's a reverse, reimbursable fund. So we have to put the money out, and then if we win, um, we would then be reimbursed for the cost of the litigation fees and a lawyer. Um. See what other questions I have for you. Uh, so that hundred and how much was it again? 110,000? 110, that has been paid? Yes. And the reason, Mr. Uh, What's Mr. That? Chairman, the reason we do this every year for the reprogramming because our non personnel service from 2010 was 240,000, and as of 2013, we have 62,000 due to the three budget gap close cut the agency received for the last from 2010 through 2011. I'm, I'm not following you. From 2011 to, from 2009 through 2011, we have a 678,000 budget cut. And to cover all those three budget cut, we have to reduce all our non-personnel service. We ended up, our non-personnel service not including in the fixed costs, reduced it from 243,000 to 62,000, which doesn't cover all non our non-personnel, so that's why we do part of the reprogramming in addition to the 100,000, 110,000 settlement. Well, let me see. The uh, budget, uh, proposed budget. <coughs> I'm not understanding. Supplies and materials, by uh, CSG 20, supplies and materials, has gone from 9 to 12. Is 12 inadequate? Yeah. Right. I'm not sure you're the one who should answer that. Ms. Branch, is 12 inadequate? Yes, it is. In what fact should it be? Our total uh, non-personal services two hundred sixty-five thousand dollars, and under the. Are well, you seeing two hundred sixty-five? I don't see two hundred sixty-five on this page. On our request, on our budget request, the budget request is for what amount? Yes. Your budget request of four hundred thousand. What you're talking to me about? Today? Oh no, I'm talking about our. I'm sorry, the budget in general, uh, the overall amount. But in terms of the three hundred thousand dollar request, uh, but, uh, I asked you whether CSG twenty was adequate at twelve. It's an increase over the current year. You said no. Then you said talked about two hundred sixty-five thousand dollars, and I said I don't see two hundred sixty-five thousand. I, I made a mistake, Mr. Chairman. The $265,000 is what our total NPS is with regard to the... But it's not. I interrupted you. It's your total NPS in regard to... Our need. Our need is $265,000. Your need. Your request for additional dollars. Our, no. The, the total, are based on our calculus of what our cost is, it's $265,000. The amount that we received... Um, in the budget is no, it's not that piece of paper. $217,000, is that right? I, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm looking at table three. Table three. 
I'm comparing, Mr. Chairman, the total for the non-personnel services, including the supplies, contracts, other services, from 2010 to 2013. Yeah. Comparing and saying, you know, we reduce our, our non-personnel service reduced from 243,000 in 2010. That was what was available to us. Uh, I don't see 233. I don't see 210. This is what I see. You spent $675,000 in FY11. You spent $604,000 in FY12. The mayor's proposed $1,287,000. I'm talking for the non-personnel. What's that? The non-personnel. Yeah, non-personnel. Yes. Yeah. So what is it? He's saying he has a... So this is the chart he's got. This is the chart he's looking at. This is it. This is the chart he's looking at. Could you repeat those numbers again? What's that? Could you repeat those numbers again? Do you have numbers? table three in front of you? Yeah. AC3? Correct. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I apologize for the confusion. Could you walk us through your question again, please? My question was, I don't know what you guys are talking about. You're talking about uh, 250 or 235 or two something, and I don't see that number on this page. No, that's 2010. Before we, we take the budget cuts through 2014. I'm just comparing where we were before we have all the three budget cuts for the previous years, to where we are now. And if you're looking for 2013, it also included the 600 and 2000, that included with the inter-districts in Table 10, um, just to Table 3. Yeah, he's yeah, looking at something down there. It doesn't have the right one. This is where we are. Mm -hmm. But this is our chart. Mm -hmm. right. Even the one he's looking, it's not the right one. That's what he's directing to. Find. I don't. I don't see this one. Did you want to say something? I'm having a very hard time with this budget. Is it? I'm not understanding why you say there's a need for more money. I'm not understanding why we don't seem to have numbers that make sense here with regard to what's not being spent. We started out with my not understanding the pure contract, and it sounds like you contacted the mayor about reducing your budget by 325000 but maybe I've got that wrong. You did not contact. I mean, this is just leaving me, to be honest with you, um, leaving me thinking that when I walk away from here that surely you've got enough, and if anything, your budget could be reduced, because that's just the impression I'm getting from what answers I'm getting. Our budget should not be reduced. Uh, it's the same. Once the two, the $650,000 is removed from the mayor's FY14 proposal, it's this, uh, the same amount, $3.9 million. Based on our calculations, we need $300,000 additional 
to take care of the non-personnel services and personnel ser the, 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 the non-personnel services and to, so that we do so we have three fully funded positions and we have uh, no longer have a need to take funds from our personnel services to pay for non-personnel services. And that way we can be fully staffed. Each year you've had several hundred thousand dollars in salary lapse. Right now you have eight vacant positions. And you're talking to me about how you need money for three more positions. Our goal is to fill those positions. So it doesn't change the fact. You've, each year you've had a salary lapse of at least four positions. Right now you have eight vacant positions. And you're talking to me about getting three more positions. Meanwhile, your responsibilities with regard to CBE, which is something I'd like to talk to you about, have been eliminated or are being proposed for elimination, which frees up those people. So you have additional people. You've left money on the table each year with regard to salary lapse. You left money on the table last year with regard to the interdistrict transfer of $325,000. What I'm seeing is that there's money, and in the context of your having money, you're requesting more money. And that's not a very good picture for me. Let me ask you about the CBE. The mayor's proposed taking the CBE audit function, um, putting it back in the um, Department of Small Local Disadvantaged Businesses. Uh, you did an audit earlier this year of the CBE program where you found a number of problems. What is your view of the best way for the council or the government to understand compliance with the CBE program? We've done, uh, since 2009, uh, when the CPC unit was moved to ODCA, we've done 14 audit reports uh, in which we have reviewed uh, agency performance and compliance with CBE and also public-private developer compliance with uh, the CBE requirements. Uh, during the period that the CPCU has been with ODCA, we've um, developed uh, certain processes to review uh, agency expenses and the expenses of, and compliance of public-private developers. Um, my concern is if the function is moved from ODCA to DSLBD, uh, there will be a period where uh, DSLBD will have to develop the necessary processes so that they can, uh, as we did, uh, properly review uh, agency compliance and compliance with public-private developers. Um, I might suggest that uh, as we consider the moving uh, the CBCU to DSLBD, we may want to incorporate a period of transition so that uh, once a function is given to uh, DSLBD, they are uh, properly um, they have the necessary resources and databases to uh, review the work of the agencies and the public-private developers. Uh, at this point, it's my understanding that DSLBD, while they have the, uh, the reports, they've not compiled them in a database so that it's not possible for them immediately to begin an assessment of the public-private developers. And while we have a database, uh, it was developed um, by the auditor's office, we can't share that database with them because of the impact it would have on future audits and a lack of independence for the auditor's office to review DSLVD. I don't follow that last point, which is, uh, I guess, tangential to my question, but maybe we can, uh, let's go down that in a second. Um, so what you're saying is that the transition to of the audit function back to the executive branch um, can work, but that there ought to be a transition period. So that during that transition period, uh, DSLBD will have time to develop a database and the necessary resources and procedures to properly review the agencies and the private public developers. Um, I saw your letter objecting to DSLDB using um, 
your database. Um, and I, I don't know that I agreed with um, the conclusion because it's not clear to me but that the standard that you cited in the um, generally accepted government auditing standards yes. is one that seems to me to be about your auditing your own database. But if they take the function, um, for one thing, it's not clear when you would be auditing them, if you would be auditing them again anytime soon, if they have the function, not clear you'd be auditing them. So if you're not auditing them, you wouldn't be auditing your own database. And second, if it's theirs and they now have that responsibility, you have no interest in their database, so there would be no conflict. Actually, Mr. Mr. Chairman, the database is our database. The, de the database was de de developed by ODCA. If they were to use that same database and we conducted an audit of DSLBD in which DSLBD was using that database that was created by ODCA, we would, in fact, be auditing our own database. It's only yours if it's your responsibility. It's only yours if you feel some interest in it. I, I the issue is um, your independence in conducting an audit. So if, if you're going to audit me and I have some process, but I don't know how to do that process, mm -hmm. and I say to you, well, give me the process, so then you give me the process and you audit me, I could see where one could argue you gave me the tools, you gave me the process, and therefore you might not be completely independent in auditing me. But I don't think that follows here. The function is going from you to them. You may not even be auditing them. And if you don't audit them, there's no issue of independence. And if you do audit them at some point in the future, you no longer have an interest in their database. It's not yours. It's theirs. And they will have made modifications to it. And so I don't get how your independence is impaired. It's not just the function, Mr. Chairman. It's the database that we developed, that was developed at the auditor's office. So in addition to, despite, if we separate the function, the review of the uh, DSLBD and the agencies, it would also be a review of the database. So the database, not the function, is the issue. So if we were to review DSLBD after the function goes to DSLBD, we'd be in the position, if they had the database, of reviewing our own work. That's the independence issue. Has uh, Mr. Um, has that office gotten back to you? Yes, they have. They've agreed not to use the database. Uh, I don't have any other questions for you. Mr. Grasso, do you have any questions? Uh, no, thank you, Chairman. I, I'm uh, just prepping for the UDC aspect of this hearing. I've been following this discussion in my office and uh, find it uh, just as interesting as you've mentioned, uh, wondering when money's going, where it's going, and so I'll look forward to the follow-up from this hearing. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have no further questions for you. Um, if you um want uh, to, uh, in light of this discussion, clarify any of your answers, I invite you to do so. We will. Okay. Thank you very much. We're going to turn now to the University of the District of Columbia, and um, it's our practice that the uh, government witnesses, in this case, um, Dr. Lyons and whoever is with him, that you'll be at the end and benefit from the um, public testimony that we are about to hear. And uh, I will be asking people to come up in groups of uh, four, not knowing whether they agree with each other. But that's part of what makes the hearing interesting. Give me just a moment. Uh, witnesses will be on a three-minute clock. 
Uh, let me ask if uh, Gabriel Ralty is here. If she would come forward, Daniel Greenberg, Michael Sindram, uh, Abdul Hamid Nuruddin. Um, and then the way this works is uh, there's a little black box on the table there, and it'll count down the um, minutes. What I hope we do is that there'll be a warning when there's one minute left. You'll hear a little beep. And uh, also we'll get a yellow light. And so be mindful of the time. And, um, is the clock working correctly, Mr. Chair? Works correctly for everybody. Have except, you calibrated it? Except for those who believe that it doesn't work correctly, Mr. Syndrome. You may sit down if you wish. Appreciate that. I wanted to weigh in with the auditor. I'm going to say a few words. Well, you have to be on time. As long as you don't bite me, I won't bite you. So let's begin with Ms. Uh, Ralty. Mm -hmm. I, did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for listening to me. I hope my testimony will help the Council make wise decisions about UDC budget. My name is Gabriel Ralte. Today I'm going to testify about UDC officials trying to stop the DC Council taking action by falsely characterizing my complaints as merely student affairs. But my complaint is about the ethical foundations of UDC and whether or not UDC has misled this Council. In the spring of 2010, UDC officials deliberately disenfranchised thousands of community college students. UDC discriminated against us by suppressing our right to vote and be represented by student government. UDC refused to answer my questions about UDC suppressing the vote of thousands of UDC students. I appealed to the trustees and Dr. Epps, Vice President of Student Affairs, finally admitted taking away voting rights. But Dr. Epps failed to explain where the student affairs got the authority to override the UDC constitution. She failed to justify this disenfranchisement and discrimination against two years at UDC. Why was UDC voters, UDC's voter suppression necessary? UDC should have restored my election at, the, at that point and apologized. But instead, UDC officials flip-flopped and denied ever making the false claim that UDC CC students are not UDC students. Former President Sessoms denied making the claim and so did UDC government relations lawyer, Mr. Thomas Redmond. But I forwarded to your office the email from former council chair Gray, where UDC told Gray I was not a UDC student because I was a UDC community college student. Will you please hold UDC officials accountable for these statements? Trustee Crider also testified that when she met with me, she heard my complaint and took my questions, but she never answered my questions. Trustee Chair Crider testified that I was not truthful with you. Where is her evidence that I was not truthful? I will be glad to answer any questions of UDC's questions so you can determine where the truth lies. Can UDC say the same? Is UDC finally willing to answer my questions? Can you really trust the trustees? If not, if you know where the truth lies, and you know where that UDC has failed the most basic ethical questions, eth ethical tests. So why would you have no strings attached to funding for an institution with fundamental ethical failings? Please make UDC, UDC's taxpayers' funds conditional on UDC finally answering all outstanding students' questions about UDC's ethical conduct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alte. Mr. Greenberg. Thank you. I'd like to follow up on a couple of things that, uh, that Gabriel said, um, especially about um, this being a student affairs matter as opposed to a matter that goes to the very heart of the ethical conduct and the integrity of UDC. Uh, I don't think anyone doubts that UDC should uh, perform its mission. The question is how it's doing it and whether the people who are currently there uh, are actually have the best interests of the students at heart. Uh, I'd like to point out a couple of statements that UDC has made. Uh, when they invalidated her election, they said that community college students are not UDC students. We have this in writing from uh, your, your predecessor, uh, Chairman Gray. Uh, we provided that. Now UDC says, and this came from President Sessoms and from, I believe, Mr. Redmond, now UDC says they never made that claim, but we provided it to you in writing. How is that acceptable conduct by a public university? 
when Trustee Kreider testified before you, she claimed that the, uh, the students made the decision to invalidate Gabriel's election, but the uh, students did so, the Student Election Board did so, only with the misleading information that Gabriel was not a UDC student, because the student election procedures say that UDC undergraduates are allowed to run for office. UDC uh, uh, Student Affairs Office gave false information to the, uh, and that's why uh, they ruled the way they did. But the Student Affairs, uh, the, the, excuse me, the, the Student Election Board also ruled that Gabriel was entitled to have her election rerun in fall of 2010 so that she could make sure that she cleared up any issues that might have been outstanding with her eligibility to run. UDC failed to do this. Gabriel has asked them for three years to explain why they failed to follow the rules that the election board laid down for them. This is one of the questions that UDC has consistently failed to answer, even in their last letter to Gabriel, which they said would be their final response. Another thing that Trustee Kreider said is that community college students requested they not be allowed to run. I couldn't believe this when I heard it, so I wrote it down off the uh, video transcript. T Trustee Chair Chairperson Kreider said community college students requested they not be allowed to run. Would you please uh, ask her to provide evidence of that because Gabriel Walte was the chairperson of the student senate at the time representing both community college students and four-year students and she never heard students say that to her. None of the uh, student senators believe that to be true. Trustee Kreider claimed that Gabriel was a community college student instead of a four-year student because it was advantageous to her because it was cheaper. This is not true. She, Gabriel was forced to leave the four-year school where she was trying to get a four-year nursing degree to go to the two-year school by UDC because they said she was not allowed to finish her four-year degree until she went to the community college and had a, uh, a two-year degree. Advantageous because it's cheaper is not true. Uh, Trustee Kreider said that she met with Gabriel for over, uh, over an hour, heard her complaint, took her questions, and Gabriel has had a full vetting of the issue. Uh, after that meeting, Trustee Kreider refused to release the report of how she vetted that issue. And uh, I see my time is up. There are a lot more statements that I could point to like this. This is not a student affairs issue, sir. This is a very serious matter of whether UDC has integrity and has an ethical standing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Greenberg. Mr. Syndrome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Always with the sound of my voice. Michael Syndrome, disabled veteran, served our country more than most. It's been said, Mr. Chair, the closest thing to a communist entity is a college university. And as said here, as I've said repeatedly in prior testimony and others, it holds true, University District of Columbia. The student handbook is the contract by and between the university and the student, and they have yet to comply, as indicated by my colleagues here. There is no process, no due process, no fundamental fairness, and there's no mechanism for subpoenaing witnesses. This is not good. How can you prepare for a well-informed kangaroo court session, right, and there's no provision to bring in material witnesses? In other words, you don't like somebody, powers that be, the status quo medical elitists, and they say, see ya, glad I gotta be ya. You recall, I maintained a 4.0 GPA. That means straight A's, eh? Went to class every day. Didn't come to school saying the dog ate my homework. I was ready, willing, and able to learn, to listen to the words of wisdom drip from the lips of the instructor. But because someone took issue with me, didn't like me, maybe I didn't comb my hair right, whatever the case may be, go away, have a nice day, and don't come back. That's the way to treat a disabled veteran, leave no veteran behind. I've made you aware of this. It seems to fall on 10 years. Is a honeymoon over now, Councilman Grasso? Maybe it is because University District of Columbia is out of control, has been out of control. In um, October of last year, the examiner reported local bureaucrats rake, rake in big bucks. Who heads up the list other than the former president, Sessions? $295,000. That's a lot of dough. And of course, council staffers follow suit, 100,000 plus. You as chair make what, 190,000? That's a lot of dough. Most of us won't see that in a lifetime. I mean, let's keep this thing real. And then we want trolley folly, and, and we want the undergrounding Pepco. You have to be a shareholder with Pepco, which is, I didn't say needy, very greedy. You know, this is not good. And then the students have to pay to go there, and round and round we go. But the point is this. I should have been finished with law school long ago and far away. Can a brother get some help? In the words of Martin King, when the rights of one are violated, the rights of all are endangered. Right? Today it's me, and tomorrow it's you, and so on and so forth. And injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Councilman Grasso, 
need to get busy, man. You got to roll up your sleeves and get your manicure dirty. All right. That honeymoon was nice, but there's a lot to be done. And you made promises to we the people, which you have yet to fulfill. You've heard him here. I've come repeatedly in many committees with you sit. And it seems to fall on 10 years. Business as usual. The culture of corruption alive and well. That's not going to cut it. All right. It's just not going to cut it. I do want to thank you, Mr. Chair, for using the phone the other day. That was an accommodation. And I did want to weigh in briefly on the DC audit. Hey, you do know your time's expired. That clock is not working right. But I'll, I'll, I'll wait till. Um, okay. You, thank you. Mr. Jordan. Dialogue. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, Council members. My name is Abdul H. Nurdin, and uh, the uh, list uh, lists me as the Vice President of the Honor Society. I am the Regional Officer that is the President of the Washington, D.C. area. I'd like to talk from a student view about the fiscal year 2014 budget priorities. The adequate funding and support of UDC and the community college is essential, especially as the council has seen fit to put forward a transitional program for the community college to independence. The council has stated its support, and I believe that it is sincere for both the university and the community college. But from my view, there is absolutely no justification for abolishing positions at the community college, and especially in light of the data on enrollment. During the performance oversight hearing, uh, you, Mr. Mendelson, said that we might deal with this problem, that you could not tell the University of the District of Columbia or the administration what to do, but you could possibly correct some things in the budget process. So that is why I'm bringing this here. And I'd like to state a few things concerning that. The abolishment action at community college is detrimental to the transitional plan. The transitional plan, and from all the studies I have read, indicates that there must be more positions, not less. And one thing that was very clear is that there must be four department heads, which is one of the roles that Mr. Watts is filling now, voluntarily. The community college abolishment cuts are not related to any budgetary problems. I'm sure you all really know that now, because at the last hearing, uh, Mr. Woodland stated that he had budget, and in fact was under budget, and had just received some monies in which he was not aware of. The Abolishment Act as the, at the community college was in violation of council action. As I look at the timeline of when this abolishment was made, especially in terms of Mr. Watts, it seems like that was in January 2013, yet as of 10 -1 2012, the council declared that Mr. Woodland was to be directly responsible to the board and also that he would have autonomy over the budget. Therefore, if Mr. Sessoms indeed told him that he must cut some, some positions, he was going way outside his authority and not in accordance with the council's actions. I'm going to skip now and because I have the timeline in front of you. I've seen at the community college the professors and the administrators all working hard with very little. Uh, I see in the budget, one thing I did see, and it's very hard for me to understand, I'd rather be spending time on my exams, but it seems like uh, full-time employees are going up by 9.3, and we're getting rid of a star professor. I believe the last case that I read dealing with uh, roofs indicates that it must be because of a budgetary reason. So I ask you to review that at this time. Thank you, Mr. Nardin. Um to your point, with regard to uh, the um, reductions at the community college, mm -hmm. uh, generally, I don't think it's appropriate for the council to weigh in with specific decisions. Sure. Uh, I have discussed, uh, very briefly, but I have discussed uh, the issue with um, Professor Watts with uh, Dr. Lyons. Um, and the fact that there was testimony about those reductions at the last hearing, you're bringing it up again here. I don't know if others will bring it up as well. Uh, surely is not unnoticed. Um, I think the university is in a little bit of a difficult position because it's feeling pressure to uh, reduce some of its spending. And um, I have found just from experience, whenever an agency, or in this case, the university, is put in that position, that given that pressure, not all the decisions are right. Now, what's going to happen, I don't know. So you've brought it up. I've brought it up. Um, I don't know what the university will do, and it may be that they do nothing. And I don't 
think it would be appropriate for the council to instruct them what to do on that level. And I hope you would agree with that. Um, my hope, though, is that in the long term, we see that the community college is successful and thriving, um, and um, so that we're able to get past these problems now. So that's with regard to that. Uh, Ms. Ralty, you, you testified at the last hearing. Yes. And we did make some inquiries afterwards. Um, I, I'm not sure what else we can do. Um, I believe that you've suggested some questions that we could ask. I mean, I don't know if you were here for the last agency, which had a budget of, I think it was like $3 million. This is, uh, the university's got a subsidy from the district of about 60-some million. There are plenty of things for us to ask questions about. Um, but let me ask you this, just to be frank. Uh, the election, your election was in 2009, 2010? Yes. No, it is to, uh, 2010 to 2011. Spring. With all due respect, isn't it time for us to move on? Uh, with all due respect, Mr. Chairman, if it is possible, I would just like UDC to acknowledge what they have done wrong. And I want the... I want to show them uh, their integrity. If they can do to a student like me, they are, there are tons of students whom I'm speaking on behalf of them. And I'm also speaking on behalf of all the other students who have voted for me at that time. So I really want EDC to be more transparent and have more integrity because what they did to me was wrong and it has gone up to the chain of up to the trustees. Well, that's, a, that's a fair point. And it would be nice if the university um, Met you. Met, met met what you're asking for. Um, on the other hand, as you were testifying, I was thinking, well, Dr. Sessoms is no longer there. The provost at the time is no longer there. There are a whole bunch of people who were there then who are no longer there. And um, they may not have moved on because of your situation, but they I don't think they moved on voluntarily or completely voluntarily. So um, sometimes justice isn't necessarily direct, but um, the, the, the folks whom you're speaking to aren't the ones who are still here. Uh, right now, Trustee Kreider, who is the chair, is still mm -hmm. there. And Dr. Epps, she's still there. And also, um, even though they're not there, but you know, this is an institution. So it cannot just, just because the people who are uh, in charge are not there, the institution is still running. So justice has to be done. And this is not right, you know, what they did to me. So, and they have been covered, you know, like, as you know from the, uh, from the letter to uh, the email which uh, former council chair Gray received that I'm not an EDC student. So all these are, under ethical, it may be student affairs uh, problem in the beginning, but it has come to this point to that it, it took it took um, it took to a point to where it is now that you know it's it's an ethical thing now. So I I really I want that. I really want to um, to know and like to really get to the point and what will you do you know uh, if EDC has done wrong. What will you do to them? Because you're, you're, you're in charge of yes, EDC. You understand it's kind of hard for me to hold the current administration responsible for something three years ago. And uh, also this has to be looked in the context of everything else that's going on. I want the university to treat students fairly, and there needs to be independence for the, um, the student governance. Um, I think all that's important. But there's a point at which it becomes increasingly difficult for us to be pressing that point of something that happened a number of years ago. My time is up. Mr. Grasso, do you have any questions? Uh, just one thought on Mr. Nerdin's opinion on this. I, I, I've met with you. I've talked to you about this. I think you're absolutely right. The problem is, is that until we separate the community college and have it as a viable independent institution, it's going to be really hard for us not to look at both entities when we're trying to make changes and have equal impact. Um, and that's going to take some time. That's going to take a process that we're in the middle of, and, and hopefully we can keep moving it along. <clears throat> but. Um, and, and right now, and the way it works is uh, the UDC, you know, the flagship campus, as you know, has a say over what happens. 
um, when it comes to you know amounts of money and and all of the salaries and everything. So we have to just keep working for independence and hope that we can get there sooner rather than later. All right, uh, Councilmember uh, Grosso. First of all, thanks for coming to our PTK induction. Uh, it was Even though you had your tuxedo on and it wasn't <laughs> for us, uh, but seriously, doesn't doesn't the uh, how is it called? It's the University of the District of Columbia Community College Autonomy Act of 2012. Does that not give uh, fiscal autonomy to the CEO of the community college? And it also gives him a direct line to the board of, of trustees. It seems like that autonomy has already been dialed in somewhat. I think I, I'm not sure I completely understand it yet, and I'm still digging into it, but I think what it happens is they there's a bulk amount of money that's given that they can work with and then from there they have to figure out how to best allocate it and I'm not sure if there was not some cut at that process and that's I think where we have the discussion there shouldn't be that in my opinion in the long run it should be an independent you raise your money you spend your money you do it all yourself but right now as long as they're accredited through the university they're gonna have to have this relationship um, part of the independence is moving beyond that effort that doesn't happen overnight. We have to work towards that. Okay. Um, whether or not this particular professor should have been the one let go or not, I agree with the chairman on that. I'm not the one that's going to get in the middle of those decisions um, and certainly wouldn't feel like I would be the expert to do that. You know, so I wouldn't do that. But you all control the purse strings. Excuse me, please. I'm sorry. Uh, excuse me. The, that's, that is another fact that I came to find out, that actually this council took action last year. Actually, when they did the... Uh, did the right sizing plan. Within that very section, it states that, that not only would the CEO be autonom have autonomy over the fiscal matters, but there's also a line item in the budget that is strictly for the community college. It is 8,000, and I've looked at the budget, and it is exactly there. Now, what, what I'm saying, I understand that the council cannot in jump into the university or the community college and start administering and, and acting. You should not. But what you do have is the power of the purse. You have the power of the purse, and you can, you, there is something you can tell them in terms of not getting the city and the university in a lawsuit that, is, that right. the purse is obviously going to win. Well, I think there is, there, there are always risk management issues that need to be handled. On, the, on top of that, I will say that you know, the, the power of the purse is exactly what I believe this council did use last year when it put that provision in the Budget Support Act to try to move the, not just the right sizing, but also the independence effort forward. Um, and I'm going to be looking to do similar things this year, but I, I don't think that there's, you know, when it comes down to it, that right sizing plan and with all the politics that went into that at that time, we're in a new place today than we were there, and I think that's a positive thing. So. I hear what you're saying, and I want to make sure as we move forward we get it right. So keep coming to me and keep talking about it because that's important. Thank you. Okay. And if I may just get to the point of three years ago, this is about sure. UDC today. Sir. Hold on. Oh, sorry. I'm, I it's Mr. Grasso's time. I don't have any further questions. I, Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I, I think we need to move on here. Um, I appreciate Somebody talk to me. It's politics. Why I got kicked on the I asked for a reasonable. No. No, no, you had your three minutes, Mr. Senator. I mean, I don't pay to come down here, all right? This is on my dime and on my time. And I feel slighted again by you, Councilman Grass, so just ignore me. Mr. Senator. You're a joke guy. You know, I'm not laughing. Mr. Senator. I want to answer the question why I was kicked out of the bus. And the reason is. I didn't ask you a question. I don't think anybody asked you that question. You're answering the question nobody asked you? There was a, there was a class, commercial law, which is hyper-technical, okay? Now, Probably the microphone's not working because nobody asked you a question and uh, you're beyond your time and we're ready to move on to the next panel. But anyway, you can hear me. I, it was a commercial class law where the instructor, right, was studying for mm -hmm. her law exam. I was told, you keep pushing the envelope, we're going to kick out the bus. I kept pushing the envelope, I get kicked out of the bus. But the bottom line is, I paid for classroom instruction, not to commiserate with the computer, right? 
Mr. Syndrome, you had three minutes to go through all this. You chose to talk about other things. No, 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 no. There are ten other people waiting to testify. Can we get the other people who asked to testify? We've moved on. Thank you, Mr. Syndrome. Mr. Syndrome. Mr. Syndrome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony as well. Thank you for your testimony. So you irritated the guy at the clock. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's good to see you, Mr. Syndrome. Uh, Charlene uh, Petacolis, Carrie Ann Desiderio, and I apologize if I mispronounced your name, uh, Desiderio, Shivana Johnson, is she here? Uh, David Bardeen, nice to see you, Mr. Bardeen. Uh, Ms. Pentecolis? Yes. When you're ready. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I came today to address UDC's Community College and the budget. Here because we hear rumors about Montgomery College not accepting math and English courses for the community college. It bothers me that there is a constant overturn in staff and curriculum, which allows colleges like these to be put ahead of UDC's community college, which is still fighting to be underneath, well, from underneath the umbrella of the main campus. I come today solely to ask one question. When UDC's 21 million in resources is released, how can we be assured and have trust in our board members and the hierarchies of the community college to divvy them correctly. You're pausing like you want me to answer. Yes, please. Uh, well, I might do that when everybody else has spoken. Okay. Is there anything else with your statement? No, sir. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Um, Tessiderio. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mr. Mendelson, council members, and the Committee of the Whole, my name is Carrie Ann Desiderio, and I thank you for letting me testify on the budget of UDC-CC. I have submitted petitions to you previously, and today I'm going to resubmit um, them to you once again, declaring no confidence in the Board of Trustees and no confidence in the administration. We request that this budget approval require the following. One is separate Board of Trustees for the Community College. We do not accept a Board of Trustees for UDC and UDCCC. There is an obvious conflict of interest that inevitably leads to a lack of integrity. Just having three alumni members creates a possible conflict for community college priorities. Having a CEO for the community college reporting to a president of UDC and relying on UDC Board of Trustees to keep him or her employed is definitely a possible conflict. The community college uh, committee of the Board of Trustees does not meet at CC, and the agenda for all board meetings are farcical. Everything is discussed in the back room, and seldom does anyone have the opportunity to address the board. There is no transparency, and there's no accountability. Secondly, access by CC to resources provided by this council be required immediately. CEO Dr. Woodland testified at the last oversight hearing that he did not know that the $21 million was for CC and that he controlled it. Although he was new, his staff was not. So how could this happen? Chairman Kreider disagreed with Dr. Woodland about his budget control. A board cannot and should not run academics. Our accreditation is in severe jeopardy and that, that would render our hard work and degrees useless. 
Both summer sessions for this 2013 year have been slashed by more than 50% for business and social sciences due to lack of funds, creating exceptional hardship for many students and causing many students to add six to nine months before they can graduate. Finally, that the abolishment, abolishment plan for CC be abolished immediately. Chairman Mendelson, we beg you, as a council member, to give us the resources necessary to make our degrees valid and valuable. A Board of Trustees that has a community college interests and operates with transparency and accountability, articulation agreements, facilities that contribute to our college experience, and a quality and caring faculty that includes first and foremost Professor David Watts, who is dedicated to his profession, to his students, and to his colleagues. We are at a crossroad today, and even after, even after dis having discussions with Dr. Woodland, students are still waiting for a response on how the Board of Trustees came to the decision to abolish only one faculty position at CC when we are in possession of $21 million, and that the Board of Trustees wants to abolish his position while advertising for over a dozen new positions clearly makes no sense. Perhaps you can find out the answers to these questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Johnson. Good afternoon. Mr. Mendelson. Good afternoon. Members. Can you pull the microphone more directly Please. to you? Can you hear me better? Yes. Okay. As a student, parent, taxpayer, my concerns I bring with hope and optimism. First, I don't understand the growth of the University of the District of Columbia Community College. I believe we are a very separate entity and should be treated as such and not an ugly stepchild. And I say that because um, the issues that they have in the main university are not our issues. So when you come to a meeting with us, you should not be bringing the issues from the university to the community college if they have no relation, because they don't. And our enrollment is up, yet our classes are decreasing. As Curry just stated, our summer classes have decreased by more than 50%. So I am, my degree is delayed by a whole nother semester because I don't have access to those classes. Yet in the last meeting you said 21 million was available. So if 21 million is available, where are my classes? I would love to matriculate to the four-year institute. I fully intend to matriculate to the four-year institute. However, it's being delayed. And I feel like at this point, our board of trustees are not doing anything to help the community college. Their focus is the main university. So if all the money is going into the main university, how will the community college survive? How can I tell my children, okay, well, you can go to UDC because it is a very good accredited institution, and I went there, and I feel that my degree is valid. Whereas if I went to Georgetown, I wouldn't even have to say that. I would love to see UDC get to the level of accreditation and have the degree mean the same level as the universities that surround it. Now, when you cut one professor, yes, we're beating the drum of David Walsh. Yes, we are. Because it's more than, it's bigger than David Watts. It's David Watts and then. So if you cut one that is perfectly qualified, who else will you cut that is perfectly qualified? Who then will I get networking opportunities with? Who then will I get my opportunity to get a letter of recommendation? If you keep bringing in adjunct professors that are really not there because they want to teach and want to help us grow, they're there for a paycheck. So my question to you is can you please pull our purse strings at the community college level to make sure that we receive what we need so that we can get full-time staff and stop overwhelming the ones that we have so that we can hold on to the very good people that we have on staff. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Bardeen? Chairman Mendelson, members of the Committee of the Whole, thank you for letting me testify. We all know graduates, alumni of UDC, who are a great credit to the university, to our community, and to our country, made a great contribution. UDC has been, can be, and should be an important educational institution for our community, and that applies to the flagship, it applies to the community college, it applies to the land grant, extension service, and everything goes with it, the law school, and all the other parts. I live in the neighborhood of UDC's main campus. I've taken some courses, calculus and Arabic there. I've had various experiences, and that's not in my testimony, but I gotta say, after my calculus courses, I saw one of the, an excellent instructor, 
laid off, non-tenured, laid off, because one of the previous budget cuts, one of the previous budget concerns. So I'm here to testify about the mayor's proposal for almost $154 million in the gross budget for UDC. It raises a red flag because it cuts almost $20 million from last year of federal grant funds, a 38% cut. Why? What's going on? Well, what's going on is there was a mistake made in the budget for 2013 roughly $20 million error, an overstatement of the revenues. The revenue estimates control what may be appropriated. The revenue estimates are made by the office of the DCCFO, who actually is responsible for, under current law, is responsible for the financial management at UDC. One of the things you've got find out is whether there's still mistakes which haven't been done. It's to the credit of the people who found the error, flagged the error, and got it corrected in this budget that Mayor Gray presented to you. But are there any other mistakes? If there are, I call upon the council to make sure that this budget is adjusted appropriately to reflect the best estimate of revenues and not something else. I call on you to find out from the office of the chief financial officer on the one hand and UDC on the other hand, why they think such errors were made and most important, how do you prevent such errors in the future? You've got to have budgeting which is honest, competent, sound as the foundation for building the kind of educational institutions we want at all levels. If our budgeting isn't sound, the whole planning process is on sand. I'd like you to think about whether there's enough expertise on accounting matters peculiar to academic institutions. And is there enough continuity or is there too much turnover in the way this is managed? Whatever reason OCFO may have for turning over the people who are responsible for the departments of government, does that really apply to educational institutions? Now I call your attention to the fact that this budget... Mr. Bardini, your time's expired. Can, can you wrap up real quickly? I'll wrap it up. It proposes a 24% increase in the athletic department budget. I question that. I ask you to dig in, find out what they're really spending on intercollegiate athletics, not only the athletic department, but how recruiting out of district athletes, housing them, et cetera. That's a lot of problem in my mind, and in fact, that's how I noticed on the same page, H44 of the mayor's budget, this increase in athletics and a $19 million decrease in student aid. Thank, thank you. When you think about, if you want me to wrap up, so when you well, Yeah, but I asked you a minute ago to wrap up. Hmm? I asked you a minute ago to wrap up. So what I'd like you to do is look at the questions uh, unique to education institutions, such as accreditation, what other jurisdictions are doing, tapping into the knowledge of national organizations, such as the National Association of College and University Business Officers and the Association of Governing Boards, and comparing UDC with other parts of DC government, which have a different autonomy structure and are handled differently on accounting and financial matters. <coughs> Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you. Yeah, I, I hope that my written statement, which was submitted, could be included in the record. Yes, it will. And it's all. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're on five minute clock. The, uh, let me just say this. The, um, the mayor's proposed budget for the university includes a, a $66 million subsidy from the district government. It's a 2.7% increase over the current fiscal year. $66,691,000. The community college, as presented in the budget, has a proposed funding of $20,340,000. The um, question about the independence of the uh, community college is an issue that uh, I believe everyone on the council is sensitive to. I can't speak for every member, but it is my impression that members believe that the community college is important and needs to be supported. 
Does that mean that it should be a separate institution? I think that's something that we're struggling with. My own view is that there are uh, good reasons why the uh, community college, it would make most sense if the community college was part of the overall University of the District of Columbia because then one can go seamlessly from the two-year program to the four-year program mm -hmm. and because there are expenses that can be shared between the two. But it's important for that to work that there's trust on the part of the community college of the um, flagship and vice versa. Um, and so that's something that um, we're looking at and we are um, uh, you know, looking for and continuing to look for uh, assurances from the uh, university officials with regard to that. Uh, for the current fiscal year, the council hardwired money for the uh, community college. I know from experience that that has its advantages and its disadvantages because that which is not hardwired and there are some expenses that are not hardwired can then be shifted and un undermine the whole intent of hardwiring uh, the dollars. So um, all I can say is that this is a process that um, uh, the council and the administration at the university are going through and um, I am hopeful that as we go through this process that we will see that in fact the community college improves, the flagship improves, that the number of complaints about the university uh, diminish and um, that a year from now the um, nature of the testimony is different and is improved from what we've seen this year. Mr. Grasso, do you have any questions? Um, just a reflection a little bit on, on what you're saying. I, I, I agree that we're still in the process of trying to sort it out that moving towards independence I think is a laudable goal and that middle states is in the middle of that with us and that we ought to be respectful of that process and see where it leads us. The, um, the conflict that you raise I think is something that is important to keep an eye on. I'm not sure it's, a, it's there that strong yet. I think we have to uh, encourage, like I did at the performance oversight hearing, that the committee in the board of trustees take a stronger role, whether we go to independence or not, which of course I support independence, but if we don't, at least having a better, a stronger advocate for the community college at the board of trustees is extremely yeah. important um, because I do think there are mix-ups that are happening that make it very difficult for the community college to succeed, and it is a a uh, huge asset to the city right now and, and will be even more so as we move forward. Um, so um, I agree with, you know, the need to move forward to get back past that um, even c chance for conflict, which is how we get to there we're still trying to sort out and I agree with you, Chairman, that it's something we all need to focus on and something we are all focused on um, as we move forward. As for uh, lost money, uh, you know, and mix-ups there. I, I appreciate you bringing that to our attention again because, um, you know, the reality is that the mayor has identified it this time, but how do we make sure we stay on top of that, have a CFO that's engaged and, uh, and involved? And if you want to spend a little more time on that, I would love to just hear what you have to say. I, I found this by accident, Mr. Grosso. I was really interested in the intercollegiate athletics, which I cut short on. Because of a meeting I attended at UDC, I was surprised at how much they seem to be spending on that. When I looked at page H44 of the budget, I see the, the, the increase in athletics, but then I see this $19 million decrease. What was the increase in athletics again? 20 or 19? No, 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 no. It's a 24% increase. 24%. The, the dollar amount is 2,773,000 which is an increase of 24% from last year. But you just go a few lines above in the student affairs budget, and there's a $19 million reduction in the, rec in the, stu in the um, financial aid. So what's all that about? Well, I had a very helpful and forthright discussion with the associate CFO for the, uh, public, uh, for the public education complex. Ms. Shepard, she explained to me it was a mistake that there was a double counting. This is an elementary error which should never happen in any accounting system, public, university, ordinary government, private or anything else, double counting. What's happened? The budget that was approved by the council last year 
assumed, one, that a certain amount of federal student aid loans, I'm not talking about Pell Grants, it's a whole different issue that's worth looking into, but we're talking about student loans right. that would be collected by the students and that that would be income to UDC. But then in the anticipated tuition income from the students, they didn't deduct that. Right. So it was counted twice. Right. right. Okay? What you've got to be careful. I understand is not to let that happen in anything that is proved in the next budget. Because keep in mind, the mayor's budget includes two pieces. There's the local funds, the subsidy, which is 60-some million dollars of local funds. But there's the gross enterprise budget, which you also vote for. And there's also in the Budget Request Act, the mayor submitted and it is introduced right. at his request. What? Well, just one other, I mean, I, I have a, I also am aware that there were some 300 students that were purged this semester because they couldn't get the financial aid they needed to attend school. Uh, and so if we're investing $2.7 million in an athletic program when we have students that can't afford to go to the university that's supposed to be available to the students who can't afford to go to university, that's right. then that's a fundamental problem. So I'm, I'm, I appreciate you pointing that out. And, you know, I, I have a real problem with that when, when the, where's the focus and what's the focus yep. and attention. Um, and I think we're moving into a new time. So we have to put this on the table today uh, so that as we move into a new administration and new ideas and a transformation, uh, it, people are readily aware of it so that next year or the year after we can say, you knew, now why is it like this again? You know, I would expect with the impressive credentials that Dr. Lyons brings to the table that's and right. everything that's, that has been going on, it would help. I do want to mention to you, though, that in addition to the athletic program, you can't find the whole cost of this thing on that line. And that's why I say this committee has got to dig it out. There's also housing. I'm, there's a lot of housing money to house out-of-town athletes who've been recruited for this handful of teams that we're paying for. And my question to you is, is this a good use of right. money, at least at this time? I mean, as one trustee put it to me, if the university had a $300 million endowment right. and the alumni were clamoring, for more sports teams, all right, maybe you want to do it, but. Okay, thank you. Appreciate your all's testimony, really do. Mr. Mendelson, if I may. Yes. With regard to um, the election process that now goes on at the university, I'm a part of that process. When we did the student board of trustee election, I was a part of that. I was on that committee. So I'm not sure if we have, I know as a university we have progressed. There was no discrimination. There were questions raised. However, they were addressed and they were mediated. The concerns were legitimate, so they were addressed with the proper people. The committee as a whole agreed. We did not move forward with, uh, with prejudice. And I'm also a part of the student government election at the community college. And moving forward, there have been changes. So we don't want to make it seem as though the university is the bad guy. Right. And we don't want to make it seem as though the community college is horrible. It is not. We're fighting for it because we believe in it. But as far as uh, Ms. Gabrielle, Ms. Gabrielle, I can assure you that that is not going on now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, each of you, for your testimony. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, um, Dr. Connie Webster here. She is chairperson of the UDC Faculty Senate. Uh, Cheryl Mitchell Gaines, a pastor with Regeneration House of Prayer. Ternice Wilkins, a deacon at Regeneration House of Praise. Reverend Angeloid Fenrick, Executive Director of Columbia Learning International Ministries, Inc. Well, Reverend Fenwick, please come forward. Uh, Reverend Dr. Judy Fisher, if she's here, Executive Director of Mercy Outreach Ministry International, Inc. And Steve Coleman, if he is here. Um, uh, let's see, do I want to re go over those names again? Uh, Cheryl Mitchell Gaines, Ternice Wilkins, uh, Reverend Dr. Judy Fisher, Steve Coleman, 
I have Tony's Wilkins and uh, Reverend Gaines' uh, testimony. If I may read it after I've given mine. You still get three minutes. That's all you get. Okay, I understand. Thank uh, you. Is since I have two other seats there, is there anybody else present who wishes to testify before we get to the university? All right, Dr. Webster. Good. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson. Uh, to the other council members as well, and to the public that's present here today. I'm Connie M. Webster, a professor of nursing at the flagship Venice campus of the university, and I'm also the current chairperson for the faculty senate. And I thank you, Chairman Mendelson, for this opportunity to appear before you today. For the few minutes that I have before you, I would like to first share with you the importance of having pipeline programs at the community college that feed our programs, and more specifically, the Bachelor of Science in Nursing program at the flagship university. This fall, we are positioned to add 30 new students to our junior level due to an existing articulation and scholarship opportunity. This statement, I hope, is an important example of the critical role and the relationship of the community college to flagship programs. More importantly, the two institutions afford citizens of the District of Columbia a seamless education continuum that enhances their professionalism and their employability. However, current funding levels for the university will not adequately sustain the two institutions, nor place them in the best position for credentials of excellence through accreditation, nor to provide quality instruction and resultant student learning. In fact, our regional accrediting body, the Middle States, has cited financial concerns and monitored the status of the university even before the addition of the community college. Therefore, it is our hope that through the best reasoning, this committee will find justification to support and facilitate a budget or budgets that support both institutions and pay that would attract quality faculty as we are redefining the district state university. Second, I call attention to additional problems for programs with specific discipline accreditations resulting from cuts in the capital improvement allocations. As we are hearing, there is possibly a $96 million cut over several years. In the past three years, changes in our funding levels have resulted in aborting plans to renovate laboratories and class space, some of which are dates uh, are dates and space allowances mandated by accrediting standards. Our nursing laboratories are outdated and antiquated, which diminishes our teaching and application strategies that enhance student learning. Further, at a time when our programs cannot get clinical space in our community hospitals, our department budgets will not permit us to purchase and update simulators and software programs to bridge the application gap in our clinical lab curricula. Lastly, while I need not say how important technology is today, without these resources required for adequate in educational environment, they're all threatened or impacted at our institutions if the funds are not available. The citizens of the District of Columbia deserve a quality public institution, and the students and faculty at the University of the District of Columbia deserve an environment equipped and conducive to learning. I speak for the faculty at large and advocate for our students as I request that this committee assess and facilitate our true potential and capacity to provide a quality education to our citizens through your support and recommendations for adequate funding that supports both institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Webster. Um, Reverend, Reverend Fenrick. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mendelson and committee for this opportunity to come before you today. <clears throat> I have the um, testimony of um, Reverend uh, Cheryl Gaines, who could not come today. I, mine is very short, and so I'll read hers first. She has combined the testimony of um, Tony's Wilkins and with some other reference letters. <clears throat> 
Pastor Shell Mitchell Gaines of Regeneration House of Praise, aka the Church in the Field, serving in Southeast Washington, D.C. She formally introduced herself as a preaching lawyer from New Orleans by way of New York, sent to a field in Southeast D.C. to bring messages of salvation, hope, healing, and deliverance to the least, the last, the lost, and the no longer left out. She started serving in the field and preaching on the streets in Southeast in 2010 after four young people were murdered on South Capitol Street in a drive-by shooting a few blocks away from where we meet. The community had built a makeshift memorial to the murdered youth, and the Lord led her to preach on the street where so much death had occurred to offer life and hope through the gospel of Jesus Christ to a distraught and distressful people in the community. Her church and its ministries, particularly Project Everyone Deserves to Eat Naturally, that is Project Eating, Eden, seeks to make a difference in the lives of the people in Southeast by addressing the whole person. UDC's College of Agriculture, Urban Sustainability, and Environmental Sciences causes has been a tremendous asset to what we do in the community to empower and improve the lives of the people we serve. Many of the programs offered through the land grant centers of UDC causes measurably improve the economic opportunity of residents in the district. Causes programs focus on skills development in areas such as small business development, urban food production, master gardening, composite food safety, nutrition, education, health prevention, especially obesity and diabetes, exercises and age appropriate diets. I testified in March, she says, regarding the performance of causes and the impact of the land grant programs on our uh, congregation and community. I now submit my testimony to ask that you reconsider the cuts that have been enacted that aver adversely affect the ability of the university to remain a partner to churches like ours. I have included in this letter some testimonies of those who have participated re in receiving their food handler's license. Uh, through causes. And she has listed uh, one, two, three, four, five, six testimonies, and each one of them are actively uh, using what they have received to uh, further their employment, testifying to the, um, uh, the effectiveness of the things that causes uh, handles. Uh, she has one testimony, without obtaining my food handling license, the, uh, the, with, a, with obtaining my food handling license, this has allowed me to put one of my visions in place, and that was to start on full service event planning business where we offer decorating, set up services, and so forth. My testimony is as a graduate of the University of the District of Columbia, I've used the education I received in the counseling psychology department to further uh, the lives of the people to the tune of cashing in my retirement so that I could help the homeless. Uh, I'm asking you to please consider uh, all of the funding that UDC has asked for, including the cuts that have been done. And I'm placing a demand on heaven that uh, you all have the funds to do that. And I ask that whatever you do, that you do it in a righteous manner. Thank you so much. For thank, thank you, uh, Reverend Fenwick. Um, I'm not sure that um, the funding for causes has been reduced, but we will ask, uh, we will ask the, uh, the interim president when he comes forward. Thank um, you. And um, I guess, uh, Dr. Webster, the... Um, the issue of adequate funding is in, relies in part on what the university says it needs. So we will see. As I noted before, the mayor has proposed a slight increase to the subsidy. Um, but obviously, this is something we're going to look at more. And, and I would just like to respond uh, respectfully to Mr. Grasso uh, in respect to the perceptions of where attention is with the Board of Trustees when it comes to community college versus the flagship, I would venture to say with a certain degree of certainty that uh, if you were to spend some time on the campus of the flagship, you would hear that same complaint about there appears to be more concern about the community college than there is for 
the flagship. And I have shared this before. There are these perceptions, and they're rooted in cues that we're getting in the environment that says one group will stand and one group will not. So I just want you to know that that perception is a perception, and I know that perceptions are reality, but you would find that same perception on the campus of the flagship. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Councilmember Grasso, do you have any questions? Uh, I appreciate that insight, and you know, I certainly have been tracking that as well and recognize that there are uh, perceptions and misperceptions on every side of this issue, and uh, that's why I'm trying really hard to get to the facts and understand what they really are. Um, one of those facts is that the uh, board has not had a very strong community college uh, committee. Um, and I think that, you know, that's put all the perceptions aside. I think that's something that would go a long ways towards helping us recognize the value of both institutions, uh, you know, as strong contributors to our city and really valuable to our city. Um, and I will also say the graduate program that you're talking about and the food programs are fabulous programs. I got to work on those, some when I worked with Eleanor Holmes Norton on the Hill, when we were able to help find some federal money by making sure that UDC and the District of Columbia was included um, in the federal allocations for graduate programs at HBCUs. And uh, it was very important uh, work that we did and I think has made a huge difference. And I'm glad to see that it's being used, uh, like you say, in a, in a positive way. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grasso. Thank you, each of you, for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. I will turn now to uh, Dr. James Lyons, who is the interim president of UDC, and anybody else who may be testifying with you on behalf of the university. Before you sit down, we're going to swear you in. But I know you're not going to be alone in answering questions. Are you going to be testifying as well, maybe? Well, I'm just com computer control the slides. I'm not going to testify. Nobody else? PowerPoint. Yeah, yes. I'll just the slides. Is uh, the CFO or AFO here? She's coming in. They're coming up. The grand entrance. You all ready? Yes. And now, Dr. Lyons, you can't say, well, so-and-so is going to answer the question and have them come up without getting them sworn in now. Well, she was, said she was just going to hit buttons. All right. She can multitask. If you raise your right hand, do you swear from under penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give to the Council of the District of Columbia, the Committee of the Whole, is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you. May be seated. You answered in the affirmative. Dr. Lyons, when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, members of the council, uh, I'm James Lyons, the interim president of the University of the District of Columbia. You should have received, hopefully, uh, two documents, a written testimony, uh, a five-page document, and then a 30-page PowerPoint. And uh, I was timed yesterday, and uh, if I go through each page of both documents, it will be slightly over an hour and 15 minutes. Well, that's one way to deaden the question. <laughs> of course, it might not work. We're resilient. But I, I won't do that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Do that. Um, four weeks ago, I came out of retirement to join the UDC family. I am excited about it, and even after 
all that I've heard over the past four weeks, I remain excited about uh, this opportunity to uh, lead an institution during this interim period that uh, has as its mission to uh, serve the people of the District of Columbia, uh, both those who um, are privileged and uh, have uh, achieved and accomplished and those who are on the margins and uh, have been underserved. So I'm happy to be here and uh, want to uh, just highlight uh, from the written testimony uh, just a few items. Uh, we do know that, uh, or you should know that uh, we also uh, have here today several of our trustees. I was trying to get our treasurer uh, uh, Mr. Felton to join me, but he decided to yield to uh, our staff. Uh, at the same time, uh, there are other trustees. I don't know how many of them are in the room, but we do have several trustees who indicated that they were going to attend. Plus, we have a number of people from the faculty and staff who are here, and they are the experts. I don't claim after four weeks to, to be an expert. Uh, but I'm delighted to be here uh, to present the budget, and as we all know, th this particular uh, 2014 budget is what uh, I call a steady state budget. It is a more or less a no-growth budget. Um, I did learn, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, we had not asked for uh, any additional uh, support in this budget, and I want you to know that uh, having uh, looked over the budget and assessed some things uh, early on in my uh, tenure here at UDC. Uh, I think that there's a very important need uh, for additional support beyond the budget uh, that uh, has been presented to you, and I want to say something about that just briefly. Um, we are approaching a middle states accreditation review. The law school is also uh, going to have an accreditation review. And as I've looked at uh, a number of things on the campus, it's pretty clear to me, and you heard our faculty senate chair comment on it, that there's some things that need to be done uh, right away. Um, we have some um, items in information technology that uh, certainly need to be addressed. We have uh, library issues that need to be addressed. Uh, we have supplies and materials that need to, to be uh, shored up, and we have recruitment uh, and academic support uh, items that need to be addressed. Uh, we have come up with uh, an amount of $4.2 million uh, that we feel um, will be needed to uh, move in the appropriate direction and assist us with accreditation. Uh, we've talked about a lot of things here today, and you'll hear a lot of conversation about the University of the District of Columbia. But if we fall short on accreditation, uh, then there's no need to talk about many of the other items. Uh, Middle States expects us to move in an appropriate direction. And furthermore, uh, as I have shared with you in the past, I used to serve on the Middle States Commission, and I have chaired visiting teams for Middle States. So they know that I know uh, what needs to be done. And so I place that uh, before you. I've also learned since my arrival that uh, we have been, uh, we're faced with having to uh, pick up uh, salary increases that were not in the budget. Um, we are also in dire need of operating support for capital projects, uh, which is important to us. And you've already heard items such as uh, the uh, cut in our capital budget and the implications that that, that may have in terms of uh, support that we had planned to give to not only the flagship campus, but the community college and other community sites. So there's a real challenge, and I wanted to bring my fresh look 
uh, to the table on this and just share with you that even though the institution did not ask for an additional $4.2 million of uh, enhancement dollars, I think that it's important and incumbent upon me to at least share that with you uh, and the council members today. As I said, you have my prepared remarks, so I'm going to move from that testimony and now move to the PowerPoint presentation. I'm not going to uh, discuss all 30 pages, uh, but there are a few pages that I wish to highlight. Uh, if you look at page two, why don't, uh, uh, do you have the numbers? Okay. Uh, page two simply talks about the fiscal 2014 budget. It acknowledges the 66.7 million uh, mayor's mark, uh, but we also highlight the fact that there are, in fact, other needs that I have uh, pointed out to you uh, that relate to accreditation, that relate to IT infrastructure, that relate to labor negotiations. Uh, if you, on the next page, page three of the PowerPoint, it simply uh, lays out our overall budget of uh, 153.8 million, and it uh, divides the budget uh, among uh, the various uh, areas and categories. If we move to page five, uh, it shows the distribution of the unrestricted dollars, and it shows you uh, where we receive our support um, of the unrestricted dollars. 62% come from local appropriations. Again, that's 66.7. And then under special purpose revenue, uh, that's an, an additional 38% of our budget coming from tuition and fees. Um, on page six of the PowerPoint, I, I want to just point out the FTE. Uh, the FTE shows you, in fact, that uh, the university had 830 full-time equivalent uh, staff uh, in fiscal 13, and after the right-sizing initiative, uh, we now have 685 FTE. My challenge during the interim year, of course, uh, will be to determine whether or not we have people in the right places to carry out the business of the university. Uh, I would call your attention to page nine, uh, which uh, sets forth the community college budget. And while I'm sure you'll have some questions to raise with me about the community college, I do want to go back to something that uh, Councilman uh, Grasso mentioned, and that is the role that middle states will play as we talk about an independently accredited community college and what their expectations are. Uh, one of the most, one of the things that's been most frustrating to me in the past four weeks is this clash uh, between the community college supporters and the flagship supporters. Uh, I came here uh, with the excitement that uh, UDC was conducting an experiment in terms of, quote, spinning off a community college. And I have colleague, presidential colleagues from around the nation watching to see how this is going to, to play out. Uh, we're living during a time when all four-year public universities are making an extra effort uh, to reach out to community colleges. So it would seem only natural that there be a strong relationship, a seamless relationship, uh, between the flagship and the community college. And so I find this uh, dispute uh, quite frustrating, but I think that uh, we have the wherewithal to, to move beyond that. Um, if we go over to page 12 in the PowerPoint, uh, I have identified once again uh, some of those items that will be necessary as we prepare for accreditation. Um, and I also have uh, identified the fact that uh, there are some capital issues related to facilities upgrades as well. So uh, we have to do this, and um, we're going to. Uh, I've been in touch with middle states to begin the conversation about their expectations of our university as we prepare for accreditation. 
On page 13, we talk about our other concerns, operation and maintenance costs for new facilities and labor costs increase due to uh, the collective bargaining agreements as, as well as the decision to uh, award uh, increases to uh, employees. Uh, on page 14 and beyond, one of the th things you have talked to me about during the past several uh, weeks that I've been here is what's happening uh, with the strategic plan. And uh, if you look at pages 15 and 16, uh, we and 17, uh, it goes into detail about the fact that the university is working extremely hard on its vision for 2020, uh, and it's talking about the role in the future. I mean, we can spend all of our time on past issues, but I think it's prudent for us to be looking at the UDC of 2020, how we align with the issues of the day in the community, both uh, how we relate to K-12, how we relate to the medical community, how we relate to the business and corporate community, and the federal government. So all of those discussions are taking place uh, during uh, our strategic planning process. On page 17, you see the work groups uh, that are involved in the strategic planning process, and so you know then that we are covering the appropriate areas. Um, on page 19, it gives the timeline uh, for uh, the completion of the strategic planning process. And uh, some of you will be involved as we continue to reach out uh, to the community, as we work through focus groups, as we do follow up, uh, as we have a retreat. Uh, a number of you will certainly be invited to, to participate uh, throughout this process. And the final section, which begins on page 20 and 21, uh, we identify those exciting things that are happening on our university campus. Uh, quite often we get caught up in the negative, and so what we've attempted to do on pages 21, 22, uh, 23, 24, uh, 25, 26, is to show you that there's some positive things going on, some very exciting things taking place in our colleges and schools, and I would certainly encourage you to take a look at that. Um, we, uh, if you look at page 24, just to uh, make uh, one point, uh, I was struck by the number of people that uh, we reach through causes, for example, uh, 300,000 people uh, and the kinds of work that, that is happening. That, to me, says that the, the university is on the right track, uh, doing the right thing. Um, community workforce, you see the impact that uh, we're having uh, through the community college and workforce development, creating jobs, uh, and in some instances, uh, helping individuals uh, get a, an increase in their salaries based on the completion of our programs. And in the student affairs area on 20, page 27, and I'm rushing through this, but under financial aid, if you look at the amount of financial aid that our students receive, I would only remind you that uh, that money is spent uh, in our community uh, in, uh, for the, in, in large part. Uh, so the students are receiving money and they're spending that money. If you look at total cost of attendance, uh, students use that money for, for housing. They use that money for a number of things. So when you see that the, a university such as the University of District of Columbia is receiving grants and contracts and support, uh, that money gets turned over in the community and it certainly has a, a significant economic impact. Uh, page 28 shows you the fact that uh, our number of graduates is increasing. Uh, degree completion is important, uh, and uh, you see those numbers on that page. And the final section uh, is the capital project section, which indicates the kinds of projects that our university is involved in. And even there, there's a community impact as you look at contracts going to 
uh, local companies and local CBEs. So it has a major economic impact. So, Mr. Chairman, I will stop there having rushed through both of these uh, presentations because I know you have a number of questions. Uh, but the University of the District of Columbia is, is an important entity. And when I say the University of the District of Columbia, I mean the law school, the flagship, and the community college. Uh, so we are important to this community. Uh, I look forward to working uh, during my tenure here uh, to elevate the status and the image of the institution and to address some of these issues that you heard around the table this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the council. Thank you, Dr. Lyons. We'll be on 10 minute rounds. We've been joined by uh, Councilmember Barry. So there are three of us here. Um, let me ask you, Dr. Lyons, um, with regard to the $4.2 million additional that you've, you've raised today, can you give us additional breakdown? I see that you've summarized uh, three categories on page 12, but would you follow up by giving us more detail? I will follow up on that. And would this be one-time money? In most of these instances, uh, it will be one-time money. Okay, so if you could identify that for us as well. It will be reoccurring in one time. Yes, sir. I will um, do that. I know that you've indicated uh, to me that uh, items such as subscriptions to libraries, that has to be ongoing, so that would not be one time. Well, th there will be some items that will be recurring yes. for certain because the, the library, just as an example, uh, will have to continue yes. uh, buying electronic databases, uh, uh, journals, etc. But then there will be some other things that will be one time, and I'll break that out for okay. you so you'll know which is which. Now, there was some testimony before you came up to the table. Uh, is causes being reduced? I'm not aware of that. Uh, Dolores, do you have that? Uh... Ms. Shepard? Good afternoon, council members. I'm Dolores Shepard, and I'm the Associate Chief Financial Officer for the Education Agencies. In the budget, it appears that we have a significant reduction. It is not an operating cost reduction. In preparing the budget, what we found is that this direct loan program um, was included in the fiscal year 13 budget. It is a pass-through payment. As such, it has been adjusted. We're also looking at other direct pass-through programs, and we would be making a recommendation for an additional reduction based on the Pell Grant, which is included in the budget. So they are not reductions to the operating costs, but rather reflecting those things that are pass-throughs. That's the $19 million reduction? That is the $19 okay, million. Okay, but my question had to do with the program causes. Is there a reduction there? I don't know if you would know that. There are reductions, but those are primarily reductions based on, that, on the fact that we do not expect to get a, some grants, both federal and private, and there is, an in, a, there is a reduction in the grants that we receive from other district agencies. Uh, that's the causes program, or are you speaking more broadly? I'm speaking broadly. Okay, I don't want you to speak broadly. I'm asking about the causes program. In the causes program, we do have an increase in that budget of 967. 967,000? 967,000 in the causes program. No, I stand in, I stand corrected. This is the whole. Okay, thanks. There was Gina Dash, the interim CFO for UDC. There was a decrease of 158,000 for causes overall for the program, and it's attributable to a reduction in some of the grants that they receive. You said 164,000? 158,507. So that reduction is entirely grants? Yes, between yeah. federal, private, and um, the ones we receive from course, the districts. 
in the course of the budgeting process, the university is free to continue to pursue grants, so in fact that money could be Correct. realized. Exactly. You project each year we would project uh, the income that we expect to receive from grants and contracts, and that can change and, and, and does usually change from year to year. No, but this is overwhelming. Um, I don't know if this is to Ms. Shepard or to you, Dr. Lyons. In uh, constructing the budget, is salary lapse, uh, is there a salary lapse? It's, um, is is uh, PS reduced by a salary lapse? Uh, Chairperson, we are, tr we as, um, are going back and doing that assessment like Dr. Lyons. Ms. Dash and I have been on board four weeks now. So we are going back and piecing together those things. We'd be able to provide you a follow-up response on that. Including whether salary lapse was calculated in yes. the budget? We have to go back and do a reconciliation to determine that, reconcile the schedule to the salary's budget to provide an accurate answer. Okay. How soon do you think you can do that? Next week. Yeah, we'll send that to you mid-next week. All right, please. Um, how many vacancies does the university currently have? I can't tell you that. The, I can, that, but I will find out. Do you that's have why they're here. total number of vacancies? We don't that have that, but we, we will have. provide it. Um, and a question I've asked other agencies, is the uh, mayor's proposed budget um, equal to your request? And I think, Dr. Lyons, you said it is equal to the request. Correct. And the second question I ask is, does it, uh, is it adequate? And your testimony would be, um, with an additional $4.2 million, it would be adequate. That is correct. Do you know the extent to which, um, Dr. Lyons, since you're, you're new to the university, do you, do you know, do you understand how the budget was developed? Were the deans and department chairs consulted? How much of a role did the Board of Trustees play in the uh, developing the budget? Do you know? I know um, that we had, I cannot answer the specifics in terms of h how department chairs were involved. I do know that we had a budget committee. The budget committee consults with the uh, vice presidents. Uh, they, uh, the budget committee identifies the mark and works with departments, uh, with the major budget unit heads to uh, put together a budget within the mark. Uh, I would have to uh, ask more questions and come back to you with how department chairs were actually involved in the process. What's your view of what it should be, which is a question of what will happen next year? Well, I'd like to have a budget committee that actually, and I've said this to, to our folk, that uh, I've worked at 11 universities and that most of them we've had a campus-wide budget committee, and the budget committee has hearings and a, a real good discussion of the budget uh, from the departments on up. And that would be what I would uh, prefer to do in putting together a budget. Now, I'm sure there are reasons why UDC does not have that particular model. Uh, there might be reasons why it could have that. Well, often when you don't have money to distribute or you're in the process of cutting back, then there are times when that does short-circuit the process. Uh, but I would prefer even during those difficult times to stay with the, the process that I described. Well, yeah, because then others are volunteering where they think there might be some efficiencies. And while some of those suggestions might be bad ideas, on the other hand, there might be some good ideas that come out of that. Uh, Ms. Shepard, I talked with you uh, a few days ago about severance pay. Can you give me more information about that today? 
Um, I did send you something, Chairperson, on the district's severance policy. I got it out of the DCHR regulations, but severance <coughs> is paid based on length of service, and HR usually does a calculation. Now, there is a statement made that the, individu the individuals who left the university were paid six months severance. What we are trying to determine is this on average or was each one paid, actually paid six months. So I don't know if we, I have not had the response yet. Maybe our HR director can respond to it. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Miato Blanchard. Thank you. I'm the Vice President for Women Resources. With regards to severance, we follow the procedures, however, based on years of service and other services rendered, including military, federal government services. The you're, you're too close to the microphone. I imagine the reason people are saying six months, but six months is a max that someone, when the calculation is made, can receive. Not everybody receives six months. We had folks whose positions were abolished, who had been at the university for more than 40 years. These folks may have received 26 weeks of severance pay, but it's not automatically that people receive. Some people receive as a small number as two weeks pay, are those three weeks or those ten weeks, but the maximum was 26 weeks, not the average or not. Is severance discretionary? Pardon me? Is not severance for, discretionary? Not for career services employee, it's mandatory. For the educational services employee where it wasn't uh, mandated, the board gave the university the approval to pay with uh, the condition that they sign a severance agreement releasing the employees. Releasing rather, I'm sorry. The universities, reducing the cost of any law, law, potential lawsuits. Okay, well, I'm kind of amazed that I'm getting this information, but uh, it doesn't look like there's actually a uh, list. Because uh, I think it would be helpful. I'm sorry, a list of what? A list of who got ser how much severance people got. I, we, can I, provide, we, we can provide that. That okay, was provided. If you would. Uh, uh, my time uh, is. Mr. Uh, Chairman, is that, yes. something that, is that something that you asked for that we didn't deliver? Or? Or are you saying you'd like well, to have it? Well, um, I had uh, discussed this with uh, Ms. Shepard a few days ago. You might have been there. Oh. And uh, I said I wanted to know what happened. I think knowing what happened includes, probably includes we getting a list. We didn't interpret it that way, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> well, a very general answer that it might be on average or it might be uh, everybody uh, and um, it's discretionary for some. Um, that kind of begs the question of, well, can we have a well, list that sort of answers all that? Within the limits of privacy and legal kinds of issues, we will share with you as much as we can to, uh, to respond to that. Okay. okay. Uh, Mr. Grasso, do you uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd uh, like to, if I can, uh, if it's all right with you, defer to Mr. Barry and then go after him. He has a, another hearing he's chairing and would like to get back down there after his round of questions. Okay. Uh, Mr. Barry? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Caruso, thank you so much. You and I are on several committees together. Uh, the Education Committee in particular, you have been to almost every meeting, every time, because that's how important education is to you and on the other side. I welcome all this freshness that you bring. I'm serious about that because we can't play around with our future in terms of education. That is our future and I present. Mr. Chairman, let me just say uh, from the top, I've had the opportunity to be here when UDC was founded, put together. I was here when Lyle Carter was the president administratively merger. So I've been here ever since on that. I'm an honorary degree from the University of the District of Columbia. I'm proud of our university. Used to be proud in the sense that our university is now being welcome everybody here, Mr. Lyons and Ms. Shepard, other people who are here. Uh, our university used to be and had glorious days. 
very glorious days. Graduated some outstanding students, had some outstanding faculty, some outstanding administrators. But now our university has fallen to a point of being treated like a stepchild. And I resent it. All of us ought to resent that. It started primarily in 1970, 1996, when the control board took over our city and ran it into the ground. Ran this university into the ground. Made it sell its uh, radio station. Made it cancel the lease at 4250. Made it do all those things that would cripple it. And so you're going to find in me, Mr. Chairman, a more vociferous person. I'm going to put this in your lap, Mr. Chairman. All of this in your lap. Uh, I think it was a mistake to take UDC, Community College, out of the Education Committee. It doesn't make any education sense. How can you have a, a city government that doesn't have a continuum from the cradle to the grave in terms of the education part of this? And so having said that, Mr. Lyons, you know I welcome you. We met on this. I know of your great service over the years. I know of your great service to the 11 institutions that you uh, headed. I want to thank you so much for coming out of retirement to help rescue this outstanding university. And everybody in this room, but then my voice and everywhere else, ought to be very appreciative for you. You don't have, you don't have to come here. You could have taken your time and done some other things, but you're here. You and I know some of the same people at these other universities that you've gone, particularly Linda Glover, who uh, is now the president of Tennessee State uh, in Nashville. I grew up in Memphis. And so I don't want you to even think about getting weary, which I know you won't do. You're going to fight and fight and fight and fight. And then there's Mr. Shepard, outstanding financial person. But I'm really upset that Dr. Gandhi would not, let me say this, you have enough to do with these schools and trying to straighten out that budget mess that was over there. Now you can't say that, I can say that. Because we have an $800 million school system that needs your attention full time. I'm going to tell Dr. Gandhi that. Be on his case as hard as I can be on his case, because the university is very important to all of us. There's some folks in this city that don't believe black kids, black students, African students ought to get a good education. And going forward, Mr. Chairman, as I said, I'm putting this right in your lap to do, not make political decisions. It was disastrous for the $14 million right sizing to go into effect. It caused trauma throughout the university. It caused people to lose friendship at the university. We need a stronger university. I also since we're talking about the university, uh, I'm not gonna have a lot of questions. Uh, I believe that our community college ought to be tuition free. Simple as that. Tuition free. Tuition free. If you look at African American students, at historically black colleges. UDC is a historically black college. The biggest impediment for them continuing is money. M-O-N-E-Y. And so we ought to be giving this opportunity to every student to go to a community college and place of desire without having to worry about money and tuition, etc. Look at Prince George Community College. It has an over and over 15, 20,000 people over there. We once had about 8,000. We're down now to 4,000 between the community college and the university. And so what I'm saying, I'm, I'm just sticking out my position very clearly. I'm going to hold the chairman responsible for getting at least $25 million for this university, at least, to get capital money for this university, to stabilize this university, to let it grow let it go. I want us to get to a point where we used to be. Right now, UDC is the short, last choice for most students. I know a lot of them. They go in there because they, they have no other alternative to some extent. We don't have the best and brightest DC public school, charter school students coming to our university. Don't, it, doesn't, it doesn't work right. 
Look at Vermont, small state, as a, a massive education system, a massive education system. So people say, well, why are you doing that? Well, I'm going to do it because I'm tired. I'm angry as hell. That's why I'm, I'm doing this. I'm tired of black kids, African and other immigrants being left out of this whole thing. And so I will help Mr. Chairman, specific money I'm proposing in terms of that. Uh, I think it's about 25 or $30 million right now. It probably grow when I start doing the numbers. But our attitude ought to be, let's make this university the flagship that it ought to be. That it ought to be and will be. And it takes money, among other things, to get that done. This city has a budget of $6 billion. B-I-L-L-I-O-N, $6 billion. And yet we got about 30 some million, maybe $40 million of local money that we spend at our university. That's criminal. It's a shame. We ought to hold our heads in shame for that happening. And so we're going to be pushing very hard for very specific things to do. I'm looking at the uh, budget here, uh, academic support programs, uh, come 35 or $40 million. That's awful. That's awful. Money is not the only thing, but it's the best thing I know in terms of trying to move forward. And I'm going to call out my council members, too. I got to thank Mr. Gajoso. Thank God, Chairman, really. But from now on, I'm going to let you all know in the university community who it is that's not supporting this university, who mouth it, who say platitudes and good things for that. And so, Dr. Lyon, I want to thank you. I'd like for you to sort of summarize a little bit uh, about this direction. The board of directors all on, ought to be here, board of trustees. I told Ms. Pride, any, any board members here? One, that's awful. That's, but that's, that's still bad. Out of a 15 member board, you only got two people here. The chairman ought to be here the whole time. That's my attitude. Not just about this, but across the board. I'm just fed up. And somebody said to me the other day, why are you so fed up now? Well, oh, because I participated in something I didn't want to participate in. I should have voted against every UDC budget that since I've been on the council. I don't have voted for it. I should have pushed an agenda for it. And I love the university. And I love the uh, hard work that all of you all are doing. So in maybe one second, well, I got a minute, Dr. Lyons, could I get you a response to, to trying to make this university? Or can I get a commitment? I know I don't have to get it. But we're going to make this university the finest university in the world. Mr. Chairman and members of the council, um, I appreciate uh, Councilman Barry's uh, support of our institution and uh, the vision that you have. It's the same vision that brought me out of retirement. Uh, I, as I've received calls from my colleagues around the country who knew I was coming to Washington, D.C., uh, every single one of them uh, cited the opportunity for this institution to be a leading public institution serving uh, the needs of the citizens in this state. And, and we can do it. Um, money is important, but I also want to say to members of the council that uh, we also stressed looking at efficiencies and how, as I say to folk on the campus, we've got to learn how to do things uh, more efficiently and look for opportunities to, to, to do things better uh, but at the end of the day, uh, financial support for our institution is, is necessary, and I certainly encourage you, Councilman Barry, and others to, uh, uh, to stay behind this institution in terms of the appropriate appropriation, and then hold us accountable for it. I'm not just saying give us the money and walk away, uh, but provide the support and then demand the accountability from us. One final point I know that some of his colleagues probably also told you the other side of it. Why are you going to Washington and UDC as messed up as things are? I'm sure you heard that. I've heard it. I've heard from that. People. I, I did hear that as well. I know you did. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, let me thank you. Mr. Grosso, I really sincerely thank you 
and we went back down to see my hearing on the Office of Human Rights, Veterans Affairs, Latino Affairs, African Affairs, and all of those uh, very important agencies. I'm also over the uh, Committee on Workforce Development, uh, which has DOES in it, which is in serious uh, financial problems. You know, we spend $6 billion, that's all. What are we spending on our young people, on our adults? What are we, spe what are we spending on that law school, which is one of the finest law schools in America? So thank you very much, Mr. Lyon. Thank you very, very much, staff. And Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berry. Mr. Grasso? Thank you, thank you. Um, Mr. Berry, I appreciate your comments, and I, and I also agree that working with you on the Education Committee is important, and I've certainly learned a lot in my first several months having the opportunity to work with you. I'm just sorry that I can't be on your committee and work with you on the important issues that you're doing as well. Uh, maybe as time goes on, we'll be able to join forces there as well. The, um, I also want to welcome you to, the, to UDC. I, I know you uh, know our region. You've been here for a long time. Um, in Maryland uh, doing really good work. I've followed some of the work that you've done um, from when I was working up in Baltimore and knew what was going on in the uh, higher education area as well. And I was happy to see you coming here. Um, I think it's an opportunity uh, that we shouldn't let go by lightly. And I hope that you, you know, you'll see that in my challenges of the university and of the community college and of the system, I'm only trying to, you know, help and bring it forward and make it more efficient and effective as a university so that we can do all the things that you're dreaming of doing um, in a manner that uh, positions our residents to succeed in, in the community and, and lead productive um, lives in this district. So uh, I think that's happened in the past to a certain extent. I think it can happen a lot better. So that's why I'm um, here. That's why I'm focusing on this and my tenure on the council and why I believe in it. Um, you know, just a couple of thoughts on this. I think um, money is always an issue and is something that we have to monitor and we have to deal with. I'm happy to uh, put a whole lot of money into something if I see that it's going to be spent in a way that is going to move our combined uh, joint objectives forward um, and make our city better. Uh, so I, I, in that light, um, I'm going to ask some questions on just what I think of as how we can move forward. I have said before in hearings that I don't like looking backwards either. I think it's uh, fairly useless in the long run other than to not repeat the mistakes that we've made previously. Um, but ultimately, we need to strive forward and move into this uh, new era at the, the college and uh, at the university in a way that can put us in a position to succeed. So um, I guess in light of that, I, I think I'll just start by uh, talking a little bit about, you know, the uh, performance plans in the, you know, that we're going to be working on as we move forward. Um, I know the mayor has, uh, I guess, the city administrator asked every city agency to do performance plans. Um, I'm not sure how well you're aware of this, and of course I know uh, you've only been here for a short period, and we haven't even had the chance to sit down face to face. I know we are next week, which I'm looking forward to, um, but perhaps other staff can help if need be to uh, get to the bottom of where these are. Um, is there a performance plan that's been established for 14, do we know, to go along with this budget? Okay, I'll have to ask. Is that, uh, Thomas, are you aware of that? From what I can see, the last performance plan that we had out of UDC was in 2009. Um, I don't know if I've seen the performance accountability report that was supposed to come at the end of 2009. And then, of course, you have all the years in between. Um, these maybe just weren't uploaded or, in a way, couldn't get them. Um, but what I would love to see is what the performance plan is for 2014. Like I said, I'm not going to go back and harp on the fact that those weren't followed through on, but I will look forward to seeing one developed. I think it's part of your strategic plan. Um, you know, they can be, I think, converted into that, but ultimately what the performance plan does and why the city administrator is asking for these from every agency and from every entity is because it's a way to evaluate objectives. It's a way to look and see if things were accomplished. And in fact, I, you know, I think there's a bit of freedom in agencies to say, hey, we're at point, you know, three on a scale of one to ten and we're working towards point five, but our ultimate goal is point ten. Um, I don't think we have to say we're just going to accomplish this, you know, all in one year, um, but it gives us some metrics. And I don't know if you've had any exposure to that or anyone's told you about that. Maybe if there's anyone else here that can talk about the performance plans and what the role is that they see for the university on that. 
Well, I, I have not discussed the, the uh, performance plan with anyone, uh, but I will do it, and uh, hopefully by the time we meet face-to-face, -face, I'll have a, <laughs> that would be a bit great. more information for you. Because, you know, I, the way I look at it, I mean, it's, it's like I said, measuring success. It's measuring what we're doing. All the things that you put at the end of your slideshow were successful examples. It's part of the project here to make sure we turn around. We have to continue to look at those successes. Um, and improve where we can. Um, that wouldn't be a performance plan would not be inconsistent with the way I operate because as I said a moment ago uh, I don't have any problems with being held accountable right. in terms of exactly. of how we're performing uh, and I think that uh, I ought to be able to uh, demonstrate that we're moving in a positive direction meeting certain benchmarks uh, as I continue to ask for more support from you. Right. I think that's yeah. that's the kind of relationship that I'd like to have, and I think that works well. So um, I'm glad to hear that. And um, regardless of whether, we, whether we've ever done them, you know, we, this is a way that we can move forward, and I think there's value added there, um, especially like people mention over and over to me, this is D.C.'s money going in, so we have to have some kind of accountability coming back. And I'm, I am appreciate that you – in fact, I, I would venture to guess that in every place you've ever worked before, you've had some kind of relationship with a board or with funders or with the government that you had to do the same thing. It's not unusual uh, what I'm asking or what we're trying to do here. Let, let me say this, though. I would be less than honest with you if I didn't say that we, we have to, to work it in, in such a way that it keeps the lines of responsibility clear. In, in other words, um, the president of UDC has one governing board that's recognized by the accreditation agency. Right. So we have to work it in such a way that as the person providing support to the institution that you do hold me accountable for those dollars, but in a way that does not interfere with the role of the board of trustees. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. In fact, I've so met yeah. with folks at middle states to try to understand what my yeah. role can be so that sure. I don't overstep my boundaries because I find that to be extremely important and, and, and the accreditation body has a, has a role to play and um, I, I'm looking at being engaged in the vision part of this. I'm not looking at being engaged in who you put where or how you uh, manage your curriculum and all that but really in how we move forward as a, a city that embraces a, a university and a community college together moving forward to offer exactly what you said in your testimony. I was reading your testimony as you were speaking um, as well and you know I, I think you hit the nail on the head of what the mission is for the university and I look forward to seeing that uh, kind of be unveiled in your plan as we move forward. I think you're in a unique situation in that you are interim at this point and probably want to be the one that can make these tough choices to get our universities focused where it can be most effective and impactful in the city. Um, and that's going to include, like you said, not just accountability to the, to the body that gives money, but also to the board and a board that's active and engaged. And um, I'm, I don't know how it will play out. I know I'm trying very careful not to step over my boundaries with those kinds of relationships as we move forward. Um, in light of that, I know there's also a strategic plan that you put in your, in your, in your PowerPoint that um, has some benchmarks, has some timeline on it. Um, what's your process for that? You mentioned a, maybe a creation of a budget committee. I find it interesting we didn't have one, but what, what is your timeline on that kind of strategic plan? Well, the, uh, those are two separate issues. The, the budget committee um, is something that I think ought to be in place as we set the budget up going forward. I mean, I think that the faculty, the staff, other people ought to have an opportunity to uh, do the same thing that I do before the council. You right. Know? So uh, the budget committee is, is a process. But the development of that might be part of a strategic plan, saying we're going to have in our future as we move forward this part of our, I don't know, that's, what I was, yeah, that's it, the only it, reason it, I connected it. It could two. be, but it doesn't have to be. Okay. You know? Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. The, uh, the strategic plan, as uh, it has been explained to me, the, and I know that Dr. Kreider has been very much involved, and we've got faculty and staff, committees, and so forth. Uh, at one point, I know that the goal was to have this process completed by July. Right. I don't think that that is going to happen as I've right. watched it, 
but fact, I think the, um, but I think the, uh, the in the questions from the performance oversight hearing, the response to the inquiry was that uh, uh, the strategic plan will be submitted to the committee upon completion. Well, that's a good On answer. Timing, you know, that's, that's no answer. But <laughs> it's, it's the, uh, the the July was the date that was thrown out, but I think that you will be pleased to see the progress that's being made toward the completion of the plan. So right. you'll know that that the campus is fully engaged and working extremely hard. As I said, there are going to be focus groups. You'll hear folk uh, talking about how they're involved in this process as we bring it to completion. We want a good document. We don't want to be backed in the corner uh, with a, an imaginary date that will cause the campus to rush through the document. Uh, we want to have a very solid document because this is what is going to drive the university uh, over the years right. to, decades to come. And so it's got to be done well. It's not an easy process because when you, anytime you talk about uh, redoing, recycling, re-engineering, revamping, right. it's a challenge. I mean, you and, you've got to look at academic programs. You've got to involve the faculty. Uh, you've got to involve students in terms of the conversation. So it's not something that uh, half a dozen people go into the corner and, and, and write and come out with the plan. I mean, so you, you've got to have the input. So uh, it will be delivered upon completion. Right. Uh, but I, I mean, think, I think a good answer would be we're going to deliver yes. this part of it this date, next part of it that date, and then as we continue, we'll give you more dates would be a good one. I know you're just new there, so. I'm not going to hold you to that, but right. I think that would be a good approach. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I went over my time. Thank you, Mr. Grasso. Uh, it's called Blame the New Guy. Blame the New Guy. I saw that in your testimony, the last page. You see, just blame the new guy. Oh, yeah, that's right. Blame the new guy. And uh, um, I'll ride that for a few more weeks, man, you know. <laughs> At least. Uh, let me ask you some questions about the community college. The, um, the uh, budget for the community college is 21340000 proposed for FY14. Um, is that budget adequate? I'm sorry, is that what? Is that budget adequate? Well, I don't know any CEO or president who would tell you that the amount of money they're receiving is, is adequate. Um, uh, they always want more, and when I, that's what I mean. Uh, I think it's uh, enough to uh, keep us moving, but uh, I intend to spend some time uh, with uh, the, the COO of the community college and with our finance people to really determine uh, what is adequate, um, because I'm not sure uh, when you say is that adequate uh, because we always we can always find new uh, opportunities to 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 use resources so once I have spent more time with the COO with his deans and uh, faculty I'll have a much uh, I'll be able to answer that question much better in the budget for the community college, $4.2 million is requested in controller source group 13, additional gross pay. What is that for? That's usually where the adjunct ah, professor. That's where in additional gross pay is where we put the salaries for adjunct professors. Okay, so does, what does this mean, this increase? In FY13, it is under budgeted. What we are seeing as projected expenditures, and we could provide you the detail, it's insufficient to cover the cost for the rest of the fiscal year for the university as a whole. Let me see if I understood you correctly. The 4.2 million um, is adding 4.2 million in additional gross pay will meet the needs in FY14 as they are seen this year? As they are seen today, yes. Okay. 
In the community college uh, for FY13, $1.1 million was budgeted for overtime. Why? I cannot address the 13 budget, but uh, we can provide you the answer on where we are today with actual expenses for overtime. So you'll have to get back to us for that? We will get back with you. Okay, the question is, um, why is, why is there $1.1 $1 million budgeted for overtime? And if you tell us what year to date is or what the projection is, that would be helpful as well. Again, with regard to the community college, um, controller source group 32, which is renter, rentals, is being reduced by 2.78 million from FY13 to FY14. The FY14 budget reflects an almost $3 million reduction in rentals. Why? Again, um, Chairperson Mendelson, we, we have started the analysis, as I told you, in the private meeting. We have not completed all of it since we've been there only four weeks. So we will get back to you. Our utilities analysis is, in, is not ready at this time. What accounts for this $3 million reduction? It's $3,058,000 reduction in controller source group 41. Again, the community college between FY13 and FY14. What we have figured out so far on that 3.6 million reduction in that controller source group is that there is a 2.2 increase on their supplies line and the residual amount, there is also an increase in um, CSG 40. So it appears that they reduced CSG 41, increased 20 uh, CSG for supplies and it's increased contractual <coughs> services. And also part of the reason that uh, we have $7.4 million in FY13 uh, was at that time, um, that was the first time we put 801 rental in community college, college budget as well as other uh, small rentals for their, um, for community college use. In FY14, we revisit the rental lease and true up the numbers because they do have some escalation class in the rental lease. We, the FY14 number was the current projection of the actual rental cost for 801 North Capitol Street building. So the FY14 better reflects actuals? The $7.4 million dollars in FY13 will be more than enough to cover 801 North Capitol building rental that's over budgeted in that category. Is over budgeted, over budgeted this year in that category? No, in FY, yeah, FY13, yes. But um, yeah, that total rental, in, rental budget may be over budgeted, but uh, overall we have Pierre Harris and Backus also under community college. The original plan was eventually we will have to reprogram some dollar from the rental account to pay for the PR Harris and Backus cost. That was the original plan. It was temporarily in rental, but uh, the, the purpose was for all community college related facility cost. Uh, Dr. Lyon, I, I don't know if this is for you or, or Ms. Shepard. Um, do you have a sense of how much can be saved by sharing certain costs and resources between the flagship and the community college? If I may respond, oh, the most or all of the flagship's administrative expenses are borne in the agency management um, program code within the um, 
within the university. What we submitted to you is a list of the positions that comprises the administration for the community college, and if we were to look at those, we see no positions for such things as legal services or contracts and procurement. So with an agency management of the university's agency management, they serve both the flagship, the law school, and the community college. So if I'm looking at table four, many of those costs are costs that are being shared. Is that what you're saying? Correct. That is correct. Um, not that that's insubstantial, but is that all in terms of the shared costs, or, or would there be additional shared costs elsewhere? Those are the ones that we are aware of in terms of the administrative support. Also in the Air Force program management, we supply, we provide financial support to both the flagship, the university, and the community college. Okay. The university flagship and community college share not only agency management cost, but also student affairs and also academic support. That should all be considered as part of the shared cost. And the academic support you said? Am I, did I hear you correctly? And the ad academic support? Agency management, agency fiscal operations, student affairs, un, uh, un, um, communication and university relations, and also part of the academic support, learning resource registration under academic affairs. Those are all considered as shared cost. I think, I don't want to ask that you give me a, a calculation, but I think as we go forward, as this discussion continues about what the relationship is between the community college and the uh, flagship, I think it would be useful um, the more that we can articulate what is, what is being saved by having costs shared. Uh, I mean, Dr. Lyons, you know this issue is not going to go away. It's going to continue to be discussed. Yeah. and. Um, I think the, the better the answer can be over time, I think the more helpful that would be to the discussion. Does UDC currently have an endowment fund? And how yes. much is it? We do have an endowment fund. I thought we sent the most recent statement balances. If we did not, we will certainly provide that, but I had asked that staff to forward it. Okay, and they may have sent it, but can you give me an answer now? Um, I don't have a copy of it with me, Chairperson. It was about $98 million. And um, well, we'll, get, we'll get back to you on that. Okay, and then interest is drawn off of that. In this market, there's probably yes. not a lot of interest. And, the, and that's added to the university's revenues for operations, correct? Yes, there's 750000 allocated to operations from that endowment fund. Um, are there any steps being taken to grow the endowment? Dr. Lyons, do you know? Yes, there are. I've had uh, conversations with um, uh, the previous uh, assistant VP, and um, there are plans to uh, identify uh, folk, uh, high net worth uh, individuals and organizations, uh, and to make, uh, I've in fact, uh, plan to schedule meetings with some individuals that we think uh, could contribute to uh, the university and would become a part of the endowment. Also, there are some 
organizations that uh, corporations that we would target for that so yes there are plans uh, to try and grow the endowment Um, Dr. Lyons, when was the last time there was a tuition increase? Do you know? Um, three years, two or three years ago? In the past four years, UDC had quite a few tuition increase. The first one was from, the first one was F, uh, 2010 academic year 2010 and 11. Um, and then after that, academic year 12, we did not increase the tuition rate. Academic 13, academic year 13, we increased the um, tuition rate by CPI plus one. That was a resolution approved by the board to plan to increase tuition rate by CPI plus one annually, but this is also have to be reviewed and approved by the board on an annual basis. Uh, in FY14, academic year 14, we will not increase tuition rate. I'm not sure I'm completely understanding. So which year? I guess part of the reason why I'm not understanding is that um, we received a document on March 26th. I don't know if you would have that document. No. What are you looking at, Mr. Chairman? Okay. Uh, responses to follow-up questions, performance and oversight hearing committee, the whole March 26th. We asked overall enrollment. We also asked about uh, the uni university's tuition rate. Tuition rate or tuition increase? Uh, well, it says rate. I don't know what that means. What is the tuition rate? Tuition rate at this time for community college is $2,400 per year for DC residents, $4,032 per year for metropolitan area students, $6,792 for all others. At flagship undergraduate side, $6,635. For DC residents, 7,675 for metropolitan area students, 13,915 for all others. And graduate rate for DC metro and all others are 7,883, 8,923, and 15,163. Law school charge 10,620 10, for DC residents per year. 21,244 non-DC residents per year. Well, the sheet that I have, mm -hmm. I understand this, it says rate. The university's tuition rate since 2008 is as follows, and it lists each year, and for the community college it says resident 100. That's $100 per credit. Oh. Okay, um, the full, the rate that I just read was um, annual rate for full-time students. Okay. Um, okay. If, um, we can send you a detailed tuition history that we have um, to you after the meeting by dollar per credit, by dollar per year and by all different um, degree level and by different residency status. We can give you a very detailed schedule after the meeting. Uh, well, would you please do that? Yes, we um, will. Currently, undergraduate full-time, what is the tuition to attend the university, the flagship? For, six, uh, for DC residents, it's $6,635 a year. Six thousand six hundred thirty five. Now, Dr. Lyons, I know you're the new guy, so that's your excuse, but I'm looking at the um, 
the right sizing plan from October 1st, and there's a tuition uh, comparison in it. You just said 6,000. 635. That's the and current rate. And this is 7,000. That's tuition plus um, student fees. We do charge $310 oh. student fee each semester for full time students. For okay. part time students, it's $30 per credit. Because UDC student fees are relatively, based on our knowledge, is much lower than most other universities. And in the industry, it's a standard way to add tuition and fee, mandatory fees together as part of the true cost of attendance. So for the flagship, for residents, the tuition rate or full-time tuition and fees has not gone up since 2009, since 2009. Oh, no, I'm sorry, since 2010. Um, 2010 rate was 4,750. 11 rate was 6,380. 12 well, rate looking, is the same. See, I'm looking at this. It, it says uh, that what you gave me on March 26th, university's tuition rate, this is by credit? By credit. Uh, fall 2010, $265.83. That's the resident rate. Fall 2010, 265. Fall 2011, 265. Fall 2012, 265. So that tells me he hasn't gone that's, up. That's not right. Then I was getting something inaccurate. It looks so like, based on my knowledge, guy. that's not right. When was that sent to you? March 26th. Oh, I was here then. From oh, no, no, you were, you were doing well <laughs> until you. <laughs> No, we, I, I guess what, rather than going back and forth, Mr. Chairman, if, if you would make it clear to me or to us what it is you want, we'll get it to you. Because, well, because two things I want. Because you have different, you know, you can calculate this by cost per credit hour. You can talk about student tuition. You can talk about student tuition plus fees. So if uh, you tell me exactly what it is you want, then we'll, we'll provide it. Well, I, now that I understand, I guess tuition plus fees, because this right-sizing plan has this comparative table. So it would be um, helpful to see how it's changed. Um, so getting that information for both the flagship and the uh, community college would be helpful. I mean, frankly, um, uh, looking at other, jur uh, other, other um, universities and community colleges, um, as, as painful as this might be, it might be a way to help get toward the um, $4.2 million that you're identifying. And um, the, um, so that's the other thing I want, <laughs> is to explore that. Well, that. That's where you're headed, okay. Well, first let's understand wh right. what, the, what it is we're doing. Right. What it, yes, what it is we're doing. Right. And then second, I, can't, I don't know that I could get a um, tuition competitiveness study in the next week from you. But I do have this from the uh, October report, um, and so I could plug in the um, the dollars and understand. Um, and um, uh, and then and look at and then looking at whether I, I wouldn't expect personally, I wouldn't expect that we would look at tuition as a way of getting to the full 4.2 million, but it might get us part of the way there. I mean, we were doing some quick math here. Um, and uh, if the, um, for the community college, which appears to be uh, below um, the other community colleges in the immediate area, geographical area, uh, we would still be, we would still be substantially below their tuition and fees substantially below the, the, their tuition and fees if we were to just increase the community college to um, half the median. Now, the median is based on this table that you don't have in front of you. And that would bring in a million dollars uh, with the current enrollment. Uh, the current That's 25% of your need. Current tuition rate for community college was set back to 2000, I believe, 12, 
at that time, we did look at Northern Virginia Community College, Montgomery Community College, and uh, PG County Community College. At that time, just the tuition rate itself, at that time, is the average of the nearby three community college. Of course, we're going to do annual tuition rate assessment. We will look at the nearby competitors. Well, I'm looking at this table, uh, Montgomery, Co Montgomery College, 4272. This is all. <coughs> Just a second. Oh, oh, okay. The county tuition, which is lower than the state tuition, which is lower than the out of state tuition. Those are the county is the cheapest. Montgomery County College, 4272, worth 3,000. Um, Prince George's Community College, 4070, worth 3,000. Northern Virginia Community College, 4132, worth 3,000. I'm sure I'm going to get some nasty emails after this hearing. No, Mr. Chairman, I think you, I understand where you appear to be heading in, in the conversation, but one of the parts of this whole discussion is what is the tuition policy of the institution? And yes. I'll have to find that out as well, because it, it isn't just about um, raising your tuition to equal Montgomery College or yes. Prince George's. There are times when your tuition policy actually is to stay below certain institutions for competitive reasons. So. We've got to look at what the, the, what the uh, tuition policy is at UDC because you, what is being done at Montgomery College may or may not have any relevance, but we'll, we'll you know, get it all together. But, but there's a tuition policy that you typically work from, and then you move your tuition and fees within that policy. Uh, I'm way over my time, but let me just say this, and I'll turn to Mr. Grasso, and that is, um, you know, the other part of this is the, the city provides a subsidy, and that's what's at issue with this budget hearing. That's part of what's at issue with the budget hearing. And um, if I remember correctly from another study that was done last year, the uh, subsidy that the city provides is, of course, it depends on how one measures it, substantially higher than um, what... Um, other cities or maybe states provide. Uh, I, I'm, I'm grossly s simplifying, but um, I mean, we can just increase the subsidy or we can uh, look at uh, other sources of uh, revenue. And I think that's got to be part of the discussion. I agree. Uh, Mr. Grasso, I apologize. No problem. My, uh, I'd be happy to not have rounds and you can ask all your questions and I'll ask all my questions if you want. I mean, I, I mean, that would work. I might be here all night if you leave me with no rounds, but. <laughs> Um, I actually want to go back to something. Mr. That Shepard you're... would say, uh, we'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I actually um, want to go back to something that we were, you were discussing earlier in your round um, around shared costs. Because I think, you know, it's important to look at shared costs. That's something that's valuable. But then you also have to look at how the resources that, uh, how they're spent and how well that's shared. Because, um, you know, if you have a financial aid officer, for example, who is shared, uh, FTE, with uh, the university and the community college, then you have to recognize that there's going to be a natural tension created between the two institutions to try to get the services of that person, the hours spent, the time spent, the location where they're, where they're established um, is important. And I have to ask, I mean, you know, one of the things that I, I know happened this uh, spring was that 300 students uh, were unable to pay the tuition and were purged from the semester uh, at the beginning of the 2013 spring semester, uh, mostly due to the inability to pay their bill um, and their lack of financial aid. Now, I'm not saying that's because we don't have good staff. I don't know that. I'm just asking the question. If we had more staff on both sides, um, and it wasn't shared staff, but you had independent staff, one in the community college and one in the flagship, would that service um, potentially not, would that mistake or that shortcoming potentially not have happened? I'm not sure, and, and 
here's my caveat. I haven't studied it yet, but I'm not sure that if a student doesn't have the resources to attend an institution that well, actually, I think has, you know, the, there yeah. were there are what's called the Mayor's Opportunity Scholarships, mm -hmm. and um, I believe a number of them, if the paperwork had been done right and they oh, could have gotten okay. it done, okay. uh, would have been able to have attended the university or the college. I'm happy to clear that up if it's not the case, but I am very worried that we have when we do shared services. What happens is. Uh, some people have a priority for something and other people have a priority for something else. You don't get what you need done, and then you have stuff fall through the cracks. Right. It may have been that there were university, flagship university students that also had this problem, uh, and I'm happy to hear about that as well. Our Vice President for Student Affairs will respond. Hi. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, first of all, there is a requirement by the Department of Education that as long as we are one university, that we have to have one financial aid office on our main campus to do the processing for any aid. Um, we have been on a monitoring system with the Department of Education. They check with us regularly to make certain that the, all the processing for financial aid is, is done on the Van Ness campus. We are allowed to have counselors um, at the... At the uh, so does that mean that the students that are never going to be attending the flagship university, you know, are going there for the first couple years, they're going to be only at the 801 location, have to go to the flagship campus to do their financial aid? No, it does not. Okay, what does it, it mean? It means that we can have counselors at the other locations, okay. but the processing has to be done in one location. So what happened? Until is the community college has its own accreditation, and they um, have told us that we have to make certain that the timing is correct so that the students don't fall through the cracks. Okay. So that's the first thing in terms of federal aid. With the Mayor's Opportunity Fund, we would certainly have loved to have uh, utilized every dime uh, <laughs> that we um, were promised, and um, we were very excited about receiving those funds. However, with the, with the guidelines in which we were operating under in terms of the, um, um, the earned family contribution, age, and so forth, um, our, our students, and, and my director of financial aid can certainly say this better than I can, and I, I will allow him to follow up. But with our students um, and in that category, if the mayor's opportunity, if the Pell Grant money goes on first, okay, and that takes care of the student's tuition, because our, you know, our community college, I'll speak first for the community college. And then if that's paid, along with any loans that students were, uh, may have taken out, um, then if the mayor's, up, and that takes care of their expenses. Now, if the mayor's opportunity fund money goes on first, then, and they can't use their Pell Grant money, that was one of the um, things, then the students, did, they didn't have enough money. so. I would like to work with ASI um, in the future to make certain that when we're making policies that it complements right. um, our students and they can make use of their money. We would have loved to have used the tuition money first and then allow the students to use their Pell Grants to take care of transportation, <laughs> babysitting, so, okay. books, so, and fees. Mayor's opportunity so, for the But there were kids, kids, there were students, not kids, there were students that did not get to attend school this semester because this money didn't come through, is that right? I'm not aware of that because they okay. were allowed, they had to use their Pell Grant money first. Okay. What they did not have is money to do other things that they may have needed, like housing, and I, you know, staying I think, on campus. And right. I mean, I think that this, this stuff happens in universities and colleges all over the place. I'm not trying to go after that aspect of it. What I'm trying to wonder, and, I, and as we move forward, I want to make sure that as we talk about shared uh, services and shared yes. money and maybe even savings, that we're not compromising what kind of service we're getting, what kind of 
uh, you know, engagement from the administration we're getting for these different colleges. And I've heard stories where we are, both in student services and administrative support, academic support, where we're actually are not getting the level of support that we need because we're looking for the savings. I think with a good performance plan and a good strategic plan and moving forward with effective, efficient operations at the university, that will increase our ability to offer better services. Absolutely. Um, did you want to add something? Uh, uh, yeah, in, in relation to the uh, Mayor's Scholars Fund, yeah, uh, to reiterate, that program was tuition restricted, meaning students were not allowed a refund uh, or to generate a refund check um, for those funds. Um, the majority of students that go to the community college, uh, we had uh, approximately 2,064 were eligible for the federal Pell Grant. Um, the average Pell Grant was $5,550. A uh, student going to community college per semester, that's $1,500 as, as we talked about earlier, uh, a Pell Grant for that half-time term was $2,775. Mm -hmm. So they were already getting a refund off of their Pell Grant. So when this program launched and they offered us $600,000, uh, they said, well, no, uh, it's restricted to tuition. These students can't generate a refund to have these funds to pay for t uh, transportation, child care, and other needed costs. Right. So we were denied more of those funds, whereas if it went to a private university that charged $10,000, it sort of uh, support at the pockets of the private university tuition rather than provided a supplemental um, expense to assist students with taking student loans. I provided a, a report that I'd love to share with you that shows Great. that uh, D.C. residents, not students that go to D.C., have the highest um, uh, um, student loan debt in the nation. Um, our student loan debt is 55 percent um, um, <clears throat> Okay, it's 55% of, of all the student loan activity that we have. So um, continued support with the Mayor's Opportunities Fund that provides us with the resources to assist students instead of having to take out student borrowing would really provide us with assistance in the future. Okay, thank you. And I think I made my point. I mean, I, I'm trying to make sure that as we dig into where the shared money is and where the savings are, that we're also getting an equal amount of for everybody, not just, you know, for every student, they need to get the services that they can get. We agree and we will certainly work, continually work to um, make certain that all of our students are served appropriately. I think that's important and, and I'm, I'm happy to wait for my next round, Mr. Chairman, as long as it's not 25 minutes from now. Thank you, Mr. Grass. I apologize again. Um, the, um, when you give us the additional information with regard to the uh, tuition, if you also could give us the uh, revenues and maybe break it down by uh, community college and the flagship. And if we could get the revenue information for the last several years from tuition. For the last several years. Uh, with regard to the capital budget, um, what projects are included in UDC's capital projects budget for the next five years? Barbara Jumper, Vice President for Facilities and Real Estate and Public Safety. I'm sorry, your question again was how many... What projects are included in UDC's capital projects budget for the next five years? Okay. Uh, as of now, um, we've had to make an adjustment to our budget, obviously, with the $98 million proposed uh, reduction over the next six years. Um, our original plan was to address uh, major projects. We do have one actual um, budget uh, account, but we have sub-projects. But within that, for the next year, uh, we, we would look at continuing the new student center, mechanical, electrical systems upgrade, which is very critical, academic laboratories uh, on the scale that we can afford, and I'll speak to that, uh, looking to put some investment in, let me see, The back is site. We're looking to do some renovations there. That's what we have as of now. This is all contingent, however, on um, the visits from accreditation for middle states and what um, facility adjustments we would need to make based <coughs> on those visits. But this is what we know as of right now, is what our plan is with the adjusted amount downward. So if I understood you correctly, there's <laughs> one project and then there are four sub-projects? We have one pooled account. So we have one capital project actually for the university under which we have various sub-projects that come out of that one pool. Four sub-projects? 
we have several projects, but I mentioned the ones that we plan to move forward with. I have many more on this list that we will not be able to get to now as a result of the reductions. Uh, of the ones you can't get to, what would be the largest? The largest would be probably P.R. Harris. Okay, is the budget, the proposed budget, adequate for the new student center? Yes, as we know it now. I like that qualification. I take it that's. Well, you know, as we mentioned in the last hearing, I wasn't here, but my colleague mentioned that we are presenting before the uh, council soon the balance of that project, the 20%, uh, which, as far as we know, we will be within the realm of the budget that we have uh, before us. Is the capital budget adequate for mechanical electrical? No, sir, it is not. How, how short is it? We have a need uh, based on facility assessments that have been done prior to 2009 when we had our um, capital budget authority given to us. An assessment was done that said that we would need approximately $5 million per building to address all of our mechanical uh, HVAC issues on the campus. Uh, can you aggregate that? Can we aggregate it? Yeah, five million per building doesn't. We have 10 buildings, I'm sorry. 10 buildings on the main campus. Um, in addition to that, um, there are HVAC adjustments or efficiencies we'd like to put into the back of site. Uh, and then, of course, PR Harris, which is a different yeah, discussion those, altogether. You but, listed those separately. Yes, so your, your mechanical electrical need is 50 million? Yes. And how much do you have? Well, the way we've approached it, um, because we don't have the $50 million up front, uh, that would be at the expense of not doing anything else. We've done some HVAC upgrades uh, for mechanical rooms based on projects that we bought online. For example, we just recently upgraded the School of Business. Uh, we did in, uh, enhance the HVAC as a result or as a um, impact. As a result of that project, we actually upgraded the HVAC systems in that particular building. Uh, we would like to do, the, the best way to do this, obviously, but to do it all at one time. But we've done it through um, funding of other projects. So what's the shortfall? The shortfall actually is about $40 million. Is that correct, Amy? Okay. So, okay. So we have about, what's the delta now? So we have a budget line of $37 million now. So we can approach that. We are going to leave that on here as one of the projects we're going to try to address going forward because it is critical on our campus. Uh, you do realize you've confused us. I'm sorry. I, apo I apologize. So mechanical electrical yes. is the second of the sub projects that you mentioned. That's correct. The need is $50 million. Overall. And you have 37. 37 in the budget? Well, we had 37 before the 98. So when we had $98 million that was in our budget, we had 37 earmarked for those projects for HVAC upgrade. Right now, we have for this year $7 million set aside for. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So we have thirty million dollars over the next six years for that fifty million dollar. So the shortfall is twenty. That is correct. Thank you. The academic lab, or labs. Yes. You said that was a sub project. It is. And is that adequately funded? No, it is not. Um, the academic lab project has a long history. Um, we attempted several years ago to actually upgrade all academic laboratories on the campus. What we've had to do, um, we were actually, like every other agency in the city, um, had a $10 million reduction of the total pool. So what was left of those funding uh, dollars, we actually upgraded the Mortuary Science um, Center, which is brand new. Uh, we just did that for a million dollars. We also upgraded or have a uh, contract underway now for the uh, architecture labs and a proposal that's pending for the engineering labs and finally causes kitchen uh, are the projects that we're looking to move forward with uh, with the remaining budget that we have right now. So what's the shortfall? So we need about four, about six million, six million dollars shortfall. 
So the design that we have for um, laboratories has been modified slightly because the design was done several years ago. Um, because of the uh, reduction in funding, we've decided to uh, slightly modify that project. So we believe $6 million will accommodate or complete all of our projects in laboratories. And then Bacchus, is yes. the, um, that was the, the fourth that you mentioned. Yes. Um, is the funding in the capital budget adequate for that? It is for this year, but not in the out years. This year meaning 14? Yes. And, well, actually, this current year, uh, in 13, we have $5 million that was set aside for that. And so what's the shortfall in the out years, which begins 2014? Well, it will depend on how we approach the um, phases of Bacchus. The $5 million we will address um, outfitting the remaining first phase. Let me put it more specifically. The front wing of Bacchus is not complete, for example. Uh, we are also looking at building out the auditorium space and the gymnasium and the multipurpose room. The $55 million that we originally had in the budget was to build a new building on that site as it does have capacity uh, to actually construct a new building that was actually taken out of our budget total. All right, so where does that, how do I understand what you need? Well, I, well, that would depend on, I think our strategic plan will speak to what direction we plan to go with Bacchus. Uh, I, I think ideally, and I don't want to speak for the president, that it would be uh, ideal if we had the ability to erect a new building on that site. But should we have to uh, stay within the existing site, uh, we would be looking at building out the existing uh, facility with the $5 million. And what else did we need for that site? Anything else? Okay. So in the 55, all of the site would have been uh, completed, the existing building plus the new construction, which was going to be um, $40 million? $40 million for the other building if we were to erect that. So. So just with the existing building, yes. roughly $15 million for that, of which you have five, which leaves a $10 million that shortfall? Is yes. And then nothing for a new building there? Nothing for a new building. So this is what I'm understanding. Yes. Capital was reduced $98 million yes. over the next six years. That's correct. Student centers adequately funded. Mechanical, electrical, you have a $20 million shortfall. Bacchus uh, has a $10 million shortfall for the existing building. And the academic labs project has a $6 million shortfall. That's correct. Mr. Grasso. Thank you. Um, just to kind of continue your line of questioning, because that's where I was going and anyway. The, uh, what about for PR Harris? What's the what was the plan for that, and what's the plan as we move forward, and how much money is there? We wouldn't want to forget Ward Eight just because Mr. Barry's not sitting here. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna let Mr. Tom Thompson speak to PR Harris issues. In our original budget, uh, prior to the 98 million dollar reduction. Uh, there was a total of $10.5 million that we plan to spend at PR Harris. Uh, in reaction to the $98 million, our reduction, we're looking at of spending approximately half of that $5 million to address uh, base case life safety and code issues at the building. So what was, um, so then do you have in front of you kind of what the totals are for this? So. What was the total reduction, and then how did it split up between the satellite campuses and the main campus? Yes, the total reduction was $98 million over the six-year term, and each year identified a different amount that was reduced. Okay. In reaction to the reduction, we've identified what things can still be done within those years. So let's start with the first year. How much was supposed to be reduced in the first year? Fiscal year, fiscal year 2014, the original approved budget had a $23.2 million uh, amount. It was reduced by 5.6, leaving a remainder of 17.5. Okay, what percentage of that 5.6 was in the satellite campuses versus the main campus?
total of $10 million. What? You only reduced it by 5.6. But in the total for FY14, there was $23.2 million. Right. And oh, $23.2 million originally. Yes. And you reduced it by 5.6, it was right? Re yes. It was so reduced how much by of that 5.6 is coming out of what you would have done at Bacchus and PR Harris or somewhere else versus how much is coming out of projects that are taking place at the main campus? I just want to know what the breakdown is between the various capital projects. Right. Yes. And following the reduction, we're still in the process of finalizing exactly which projects will need to be reduced because it will be shared amongst all projects. Right. I understand that. But, okay. So how about an FY15? What is the total reduction? Uh, initially, there was $22.3 million. The proposed reduction is $12.4 million, leaving a remainder of $9.9 .9 million. All right. How about FY16? Uh, the original amount was $47.8 million, a proposed reduction of $28.5 million, leaving a remainder of $21.3 million. 26. I'm sorry. 26. The reduction was $26.5 million. Okay. And how about Leave. 17? FY17, the original was $45.5 million, a proposed reduction of $40.6 million, leaving a capital remainder of $4.8 million. And there's one more year? Uh, in F actually, two more. Okay. In FY 2018, there was an original of zero dollars in capital funds. There was a proposed increase of $7.3 million in that year. And then in the final year of the plan, FY 19, there was a proposed $30 million with a reduction of $20 million, leaving a remainder of $10 million for capital pursuits. So I guess what I'd like to know is as we move forward in this plan, because you, you're talking about Bacchus and PR Harris, I mean, at what point do they get zeroed out? Is it in the second year? So in FY 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19, do they have anything allocated in the capital plan? Or 801? In Bacchus, I'll, I'll start with Bacchus. Previously, there was an allocation in 15 of $5 million, in 16 of $25 million, and in 17 of $25 million. Uh, that was proposed completion of the first earlier phase of the renovation and the construction of a new facility. And they're all phased out? Uh, to due to the reduction in those years, uh, for instance, in year 17, where there was going to be a $25 million infusion in capital dollars at the back of site, we were left with only $4.8 million. So while we're specifically not told that there isn't a Bacchus project, there isn't enough in that year to actually complete a Bacchus project. How about with PR Harris? In a similar year, just do 17. I mean, unless there's a bigger impact on what yes, it is. Yes, same. Same scenario, that there is uh, right now a $0 amount for PR Harris in 17. And 16, so is it zero across for them, for PR Harris? As it is right now. Uh, it is also at this time where we're going through our 2020 visioning effort, uh, the identification of the academic pursuits that will be a part of our long-term plan for those satellite campuses will play a role in determining how, many, how much money will be denoted to those sites. But what about for the North Capitol? Uh, no, I, I've been through it. I think some great work's been done there. I'm impressed with it. I think um, we know it's all pretty full too, but you know, it would be good to just know what your plan on the out years is for that uh, from a capital perspective. Well, because um, I don't know how much you know about the actual lease, uh, 801, but that is, we're still in a lease position. Yeah, I think uh, it's a 17 year release. A 17 you had an option to buy that expired at the end of March. That is correct. Yes. Which we couldn't jump yeah, on, which would have been, been nice great. Because yeah. um, we could have leveraged the land that's right behind it and actually done something with it. but. But we are still in a lease um, position, right. therefore uh, capital investment there is um, something that we would not be doing in 801. Right. So, um, but you have the money in the budget. That's not in the capital budget then, the lease payments? The lease payments are actually a part of, not the capital budget. They're not. It is okay. actually part of our operating. So are they in there going into the out years? Can we, maybe yeah. somebody else can talk to them? Yes, uh, I would. Defer, but as far as I know, my understanding is it is in the budget for. It, so, the just hours. for the record, is it 
it all lease costs are included in the budget. For the North Capitol Street building yes. going yes. all the way out for Well, as you are aware, Councilman, we, can only do we do one it year annually, yeah, that's so, right. but uh, it's, so it is in the 14 years. Yeah, yeah, okay. I yeah. get that. All right. It seems like with a lease, we should have some way to understand whether or not we're going to fulfill our obligation going out, you know, to a number of years. But I understand we can only do it one year at a time. Yes. Um, we, I can't change everything at once. The, um, uh, I guess the only other question I have on, on, on capital stuff, you know, I, I understand that we're locked into this student center. Um, I'm not a big supporter of it, but I understand we're locked into it and that we can't change that now. Um, and that there's money engaged in that for the next for the next year to finalize it hopefully and, and move forward. Um, if I had my druthers, I would take that money and put it somewhere else, but I can't do that. So I'm going to hold my breath. And as we move forward, um, we will see how we can make sure we're investing in um, in the university. I think in a more responsible manner. I do not think that was the right way to invest. Um, do you want to comment on? I, that? I just wanted to say, yeah, I do appreciate your comment. I, I would. I don't know if you know, but students did make an investment in that. Um, in fact, they uh, committed over five million dollars to that, um, the building of that site. So, in what way? In raised through their student fees. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's nice, and I think years. that's interesting. I would have rather see it spent in a different way, in a different mm -hmm. promotional effort on something different. Um, but like I said, I'm not going backwards. I, I think there's a lot of money spent there, though, and that's an interesting uh, a philosophy around what the university's role is, and I think you know we can talk about that ad nauseum moving forward. Um, uh, as we move forward, though, I think we have to make sure we continue to commit to the you know, capital projects that we're committed to because the community college is not getting smaller. The, we know for sure the demand is there, uh, and the better job we do nurturing it and, and making sure that it has the support it needs to succeed, the better off we're all going to be. Um, and, you know, we've identified some buildings in the district that will work, and I think you know that, and Bacchus and uh, PR Harris and certainly North Capitol, but we got to work on them. So I'll be looking to help with that as we move forward. And um, but let's get it into the strategic plan. I mean, I you know I agree that there needs to be a process, and I'm willing to see that process carried out. But um, just uh, for the for the record today, I'm saying that I think it's appropriate to have that built into the plan moving forward in an appropriate manner. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm not going to go into my next level line of questioning uh, in this round, so I'll wait for the next round. There may not be another round, so keep going for Okay, great. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the middle states process in general. Um, where's those questions? Oh, I got it right here. Um, Dr. Lyons, you mentioned that there is uh, currently, an, is it a reaccreditation process that we're going through in the flagship campus? Is that correct? Is that something we go through every year or every no. five years? Or every, 10 years. every 10 years. Every 10 years. Every 10 years. Oh, the time should be more uh, is reaffirmed. Okay. There's usually some five-year activity, depending upon which regional accreditation you, your region you're in. In some regions, there's a, a periodic report and during the fifth year, but the tenth year is the, is the big one, and that's the one that we're facing in the academic year 14-15. Uh, so literally it's in here. The year, this year, yeah, you start to establish it now. And you mentioned that in your in your testimony you mentioned kind of preparing for that you're going to need to look at some of the deficiencies that we have in order to get up to speed um, and I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that well one of the things that uh, I've ex experienced uh, is the fact that in the non-personnel area um, I've heard uh, a lot of concerns about uh, not having uh, the wherewithal to do the things that are required. Um, when I hear that the library hasn't made certain purchases in a couple of years, uh, that there are issues in terms of uh, science classes and whether or not they have the tools that they need. Now, obviously, this these complaints should have been addressed before the accreditation visit, but I can assure you that uh, if we don't address these issues and the team comes onto the campus and uh, are told some of the things that I've been told during the past four weeks, uh, our accreditation could be, uh, could be very difficult to get a 10-year a, uh, uh, reaffirmation without any questions. And what's the um, 
can you just outline a little bit of the timing as we roll this, you know, through this process over the next year? Well, or do they visit a number of they, times? Do they? I mean, I, I haven't figured all that out. They will come in. The university agrees to a date uh, for a visit uh, in in 2015, and uh, the chair of that visiting team will be selected. Typically, the university has an opportunity to approve of the chair. Uh, that chair will make a preliminary visit or two uh, prior to the campus visit in 15 to talk to the steering committee. The campus must develop a steering committee uh, that uh, made up of people who understand the requirements of middle states. Mm -hmm. uh, the middle states has documents, uh, characteristics of excellence and documents that uh, spell out what is expected. Uh, they will talk about the fact that the institution is expected to assess student learning. That's one of the areas where many institutions now are falling short. Uh, there was a time when you could just brag about having distinguished professors. But now they want to know, are the students learning from those distinguished right. professors? Are you assessing that learning? Uh, financial stability is another area that is causing some institutions to end up on probation or get it, or they may even receive a warning. Uh, they'll want to know that you're stable. They'll come in and look at your books, look at your last several audits, uh, and uh, they've got to have that comfort level. Governance is an area that is becoming increasingly significant. You know, are you set up to appropriately to govern? Uh, is the appropriate body the one that's doing the governing? You know, right. is there in, uh, undue or unnecessary influence from other parties? Um, so governance trips people up. So your steering committee uh, knows what the expectations are, and they work with all of the campus constituent right. groups to make certain you're on track. Do you have a steering committee established yet? Is there any positions in the campus that you're building to, to work on this at, at this point, or is that something still in the works? Well, I know the steering committee is being put together, and um, uh, that will have to take place very soon if it hasn't been. Could, Dr. Bain, have we completed the composition of the steering committee? Virtually. 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 Yeah, virtual okay. steering committee. <laughs> All right. Well, I, you know, I, it's just so important, I can imagine. So that's for yeah. the main campus, university, Correct. the district of Columbia. There is another process that we're going through after there was branch status granted to the community college along the same vein, I would assume. Are those, that is that conversation going to happen all at the same time or will it happen separately? There, there is another process that's taking place, and that is the uh, desire for the community college to be independently accredited. And uh, Middle States has communicated uh, with the university. Um, uh, I don't want to put Dr. Petty on the spot, but I do recall reading communication from Middle States to Dr. Petty, kind of setting forth what the expectations would be on the part of middle states if it is going to uh, ultimately approve the community college being independently accredited. And so they will look at some of the same issues that have been raised right. uh, this afternoon. Uh, they'll look at faculty, look at your administrative operation, look at governance. Uh, they will, there are certain expectations they have in terms of uh, for example, hiring faculty, right. et cetera. So they, they have communicated some uh, preliminary items, sort of, I believe the letter said we would expect at least these kinds of things. Right. I mean, um, I think, I mean, if, I, you know, I've looked into this a little bit. I think they have to have substantial financial and administrative independence from the home institution, including matters related to personnel. There has to be a full-time chief administrative officer. We're, we're, we read the same letter. Same yeah, letter. so I, I'm wondering, um, do you have staff, or is there somebody committed to helping that process move forward? 
um, that you're aware of and it kind of like the steering committee for the main campus is there a steering committee for the community colleges efforts around this I don't know the answer to those last two questions I, I, I do think know that, that I, I don't know I, I think there is, I know there is a committee I met with uh, Dr. Kreider, who, who I see is here, uh, and, and also with um, um, Jim Dyke about, you know, whether or not the committee and the committee and the Board of Trustees could be ramped up a little to help usher this effort through on behalf of the university and with the university and the community college. Um, I'm not sure if they have all the resources they need to do it um, when it comes to personnel that would make the, you know, middle states happy. I don't know, you know, what that is. Uh, you know, enough people engaged in the process or enough effort put behind it in the board itself. So it would be interesting to know your thoughts on that and whether or not you think there needs to be, uh, what there needs to be since you've been engaged in Middle States process for a long time. What are your thoughts on that? Well, the board has a community college committee. Indeed. Uh, I, but I, I don't think they've had a quorum in some time, well, but, but yes, they do have one. But I don't think that that should be the body to do what we're talking about. I think that just as we have a steering committee that addresses uh, reaffirmation, uh, I think that there should be a campus committee that on a daily basis uh, begins to work on moving us in that oh, direction. I see. So like a steering committee at the community college as well? A steering committee similar to the main campus steering right. committee to look at those kinds of issues. It would probably not be exclusively community college employees because some of the issues um, cross lines. So, but it, but I think there should be a committee. And that, um, and that there probably isn't that much necessity then from a middle states perspective to have a committee in the board of trustees that's actively engaged in the effort. Or do you think that would help as well? I, I don't know that middle states would, uh, I mean, they would be pleased that the board is concerned uh, enough about the community college to have a community college committee. But I think they would also expect that there would be some folk on the ground on a daily mm -hmm. basis uh, working on this issue. Well, I appreciate that insight. Um, I certainly um, look forward to working with you as we go forward. Uh, in this effort um, and I look forward to our meeting next week um, the the hope is that that we can make the university and the community college thrive and be great and and I think you're a good person to get that done uh, and I look forward to working with you so thank you very much mr. chairman thank you councilmember Grasso uh, I have no further questions I hope somebody was taking notes so you'll get back to us on all the things that you promised to get back to us on yes we were because we took notes, too, so we know what you know. <laughs> we'll compare um, our notes, Mr. Chairman, to make certain. Thank you. Um, I believe we're close to uh, concluding this hearing, uh, since uh, uh, although I saw Steve Coleman come in, you were on the uh, witness list. If you want to testify, you can come forward. We'll displace these folks. Um, thank you again. Is there anybody else who wishes to testify in the university? When you're ready, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I'm Steve Coleman. I'm the director of Washington Parks and People. I'm here to follow up on the testimony that I gave at the oversight hearing earlier in the year. Um, I had mentioned that there is a uh, funding gap in funds that are being left on the table for investing in the um, land grant functions of the university's College of Agriculture, Urban Sustainability, and Environmental Sciences. Um, I was not sure of the exact number uh, of the deficiency in the match, uh, but I understand it's between four hundred and six hundred thousand dollars per year, and that there's a there's an accumulation of these uh, funds that we are not uh, receiving from the federal government because we're not providing the local match. We're matching part of it, but we're leaving funds on the table every year. Um, and this is a significant thing because the College of Agriculture, Urban Sustainability, and Environmental Sciences causes, is doing tremendous work, as I said at the oversight hearing, really in many ways a model of the kind of reform that we all want uh, for the university. 
um, in reaching out to the community and doing a variety of innovative and dynamic things to ramp up support through its cooperative extension service and its agricultural experiment station uh, for workforce development and job training and uh, intensive urban food production. Um, so I would urge the council uh, to seek ways to um, encourage the university and to support um, expansion of uh, full funding of the match that's needed so that we can leverage the funds that the U.S. Department of Agriculture has on the table uh, to be applied, applied to D.C., but we're not receiving because of the lack of the full match. What's the name of the federal program? Do you know? Um, I, there are several, and I don't know, but I can get you that. If you would. Okay. It's USDA money It's USDA, now? yes. And um, do you know what the match is? Well, it could be a total of, uh, let's see here. Um, I think it's uh, per year, 2.2 million, and of that, up to 600,000 per year is not being matched, and that and that's being passed over year to year, and there are extensions being requested to keep it pending while we try to match. So it. we're so we're matching it somewhat, and matching some part of it, knowledge. but not not leveraging the full amount, which is really having a severe effect on the value of this really vital part of the university to the community. And these are dollars that would go to the extension service or more than the extension? The extension service and the agricultural experiment station and the related programs of those two. Okay. Uh, well, if you could get us more information, mm -hmm. and since Dr. Lyons is still here mm -hmm. and the um, dean of the, um, of the program, if we could get more information from the university to understand what, what's involved. We'll do. Which would be the name of the program or programs, how much we are matching today and getting and how much more we could get if we provided X number of dollars. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Uh, Mr. Grasso, do you have any questions? Okay. All right. Then this does conclude this hearing. It also concludes the Committee of the Whole's hearings on the uh, agency budgets under its direct purview. Uh, the Committee of the Whole will meet next with regard to the budget on May 3rd when the Committee of the Whole will have a public hearing on the Budget Request Act. That's the entire Request Act, the Budget Support Act, which supports the Budget Request Act, and the supplemental for FY 2013. That will be Friday, May 3rd. Uh, and again, the Committee of the Whole will meet to mark up its portion of the budget on May 9th. The time is now 5.45 in the afternoon, and this hearing is adjourned.